Forward Guidance is brought to you by Van Eck, a global leader in asset management since 1955. You'll be hearing more about a Van Eck ETF later on, but for now, let's get into today's interview. I am joined by two guests, Mel Madison and George Robertson. Both guests over the past year have been on this program with very bold, bullish calls in the market that the stock market would rise. And they did so with reasons that are a little out of the box. And so I'm so glad that they are both here. George is the author of the Monetary Frontier Substack, a market veteran. He can be found on Twitter at Bicker in Brattle. And uh, Mel Madison is a veteran investor as well, an author of the book Quaz. He can be found on Twitter at Mel Madison One. Since both of you have been on, the S&P has been up uh, about 10 to 20%. George, up 20% since your very, very bullish call in November of last year. Uh, George, you said last year when the S&P was a lot lower than it is now that the S&P by the end of this year could be at 6,000. And we're not too far away. Mel, you've got very bullish uh, targets as well. I first want to ask both of you, why have you been bullish? Why do you think it's worked out? Are you still bullish on the stocks? And and why? George, let's start with you. Sure. Um, I take a, a rather uh, dogmatic point of view. And um, I know many people see me as uh, contrarian, but it's anything but. I'd be one of like many, many people uh, prior to like 2014, in terms of my analysis of the market, where the S&P 500 is going to go, and also what's going on with U.S. Treasuries. But since 2014, it's suddenly become very unique and contrarian. And I, I think it's because there's a mistaken idea that there's a continuum from Volcker to today. And actually, what there's been is a really radical change in the monetary policy formulation uh, which if you do not realize, you know, I, I think you're basically lost in terms of figuring out what the heck risky assets are going to do, especially uh, the S&P 500. I think right now that everything's on track. It all goes back to uh, understanding of the fiscal uh, status, which is still very strong, even though it's abated a lot from um, the highs of uh, COVID uh, with the emergency COVID remedies. Uh, but we still have large uh, industrial policy and various other programs. And also we're going into election with a chicken in every pot type of idea that will probably get heightened with uh, with Harris. And the fiscal um, spend is still pouring in. If we didn't have the COVID experience, uh, you would say it's at record high and it's scary. Uh, but of course, we've had the COVID experience and most people are starting to think that, well, it's coming off or it's abating or it's actually, which is pretty goofy, it's down. This very simple, but I think very robust and useful understanding insists that I still have a very positive view on S&P 500. And the second part of this is that I don't really see any signs, uh, forget about like thesis and the, you know, the new Wix cell stuff, but just signs in terms of like, okay, what they said they're going to do and then what's happened over the next year, two, three years of a Fed monetary policy. It doesn't exist. Maybe someone can say otherwise, but... I think that in three years, they'll be able to look back and not, not be able to justify their views that they have now. There has been such a radical change in how the Fed formulates monetary um, policy, perhaps for the, um, for the better, uh, for, the got, for the common good, but it has disconnected the Fed from any sort of um, uh, input in terms of where risky assets are going to go, like the S&P 500. So with that idea of the monetary uh, policy, uh, and my understanding of the fiscal, which are very broad strokes. I mean, anybody with Fred uh, could quickly stitch this together. Um, it also makes this very, very hard to argue with me. Otherwise, I can't see any reasonable conclusion other than that the S&P 500 is going to continue. Well, you say very uh, difficult to to disagree with you, to argue with you. Uh, I, I may try and do do my best. Uh, so, George, just Please. for the audience, the, the, the fiscal deficit, or that that is what Congress decides and there's a fiscal surplus if Congress taxes t takes more than taxes than it spends. In the U.S., that is quite rare. Uh, much more often, as we had for you know, over 20 years in a, in a row, the Congress spends more than it takes in, and the U.S. Treasury funds itself by issuing debt. So that is a fiscal deficit. And that can sound bad, and maybe in some ways, in the long term, it, it is bad, but that is stimulated to the economy when 
the, the government borrows money because you know people may disagree with me, but a public sector deficit is a private sector surplus. That money goes somewhere, goes into the into the private sector. Your views on the, the monetary policy that the Federal Reserve doesn't exist. I'm gonna hold hold off uh, and then give give the the mic to to uh, Mel. Um, you know, so so George, when you first came on in November, you we titled uh, you know the government. Money printer will cause stocks to soar. Mel, you had a similar theme when you were on two months ago when you said that the asset bubble crescendo uh, will last until 2027 when there will be a collapse when the U.S. Treasury market implodes, which is obviously related to the fiscal deficit. So tell us, you know, Mel, why have you been bullish? Are you still bullish? And how much of that has to do with the large amount of borrowing that the U.S. government is doing, which is now uh, you know about $1.7 trillion a year, as George noted, less than the $3 trillion of 2020, but still quite high as percentage of GDP, it's about 6%. Sure. Well, I think uh, George's point on the, the fiscal deficits and the amount that that's juicing the economy is evident. I definitely agree with that. You also have seen with a lot of the debt being rolled over that the interest expense is skyrocketing. I was looking at the last monthly treasury statement put out every month. Um, fiscal year to date, we're getting close to $900 billion in uh, interest payments by the Treasury. Last year at this time, it was around $650 billion. So you've got almost a, a one-third or somewhere in that neighborhood increase in interest payments, uh, which is stimulative. Uh, I would also add other factors uh, that I think are playing a major role and why in general, I think old school analysis stuff I learned when I was in business school about discounting cash flows or what are appropriate price to earnings, you know, multiples given uh, a given discount rate. I think a lot of that's being thrown out of the window because of fund flows. I think you, you've you gotten uh, recent reports out by, by Vanguard and I think T. Rowe Price just showing the amounts of money that are now just automatically flowing into the stock market every single payroll period. Uh, uh, very strong increases in recent years in automatic enrollments, company matches. Uh, you had Larry uh, Fink from BlackRock put out his annual letter earlier this year talking about the only path to retirement and prosperity is essentially for all Americans to put any excess dollars they have into the S&P 500, for lack of a, a better term, or, or into, the, into his funds and, and into, into financial markets. And so what you're seeing is even if there is a correction and it goes down two, three percent, there's this there's this buyer, uh, you know, just waiting and looming out there no matter what happens to come into the market and and start uh, purchasing. And so what we're seeing is we're seeing almost an inevitable rise. And as people get more comfortable with that and continue to believe that even if there are three, five percent, seven percent corrections, whatever, those will get bought and be V-shaped. Uh, the chances of having those actually gets gets less and less. And so I think the crescendo is is building. I think we're still in like maybe third or fourth inning type stuff and it's got time to run. Um, but I think that's the path that we're on. And that's why I stand behind, you know, my call. I was on about two or three months ago. I said 6,000 handle on S&P within 12 months, seven handle within 24 months. I, I still think we're easily on track for that. And we're seeing asset classes that have underperformed, things like uh, small caps. You know, those divergences start to resolve themselves, not with a crashing, um, you know, S and P, but with the Russell kind of making up ground. And so, I think that's kind of the pattern likely to continue forward. Thank you. And so, when when I hear the argument, the U.S. government is borrowing a lot of money, juicing the economy, and therefore I'm bullish. My first instinct is that the channel through which that argument goes is as the U.S. government spends money that doesn't have it and it borrows money and it uses the economy, that will boost earnings. But Mel, I think what you're hinting at is actually if the U.S. government is juicing the economy, the unemployment rate will stay low. And then people, as they get a uh, you know, paycheck every two weeks, they will pile that into the stock market. So it's more of a flow driven, maybe a passive investment dr driven thesis. In other words, it's not that the stock market is going up as it's justified by fundamentals of a strong economy. It's going up because everyone has a job and the unemployment rate is low and they're piling money into the stock market. Do I have that right, Mel? Yes, exactly. And just one quick thing on the unemployment rate, which I think some people are pointing to as a sign of weakness. While it, while it has gone up uh, slightly, I think when you dig 
into those numbers under the hood, you see it's actually gone up much less than the headline number would indicate. So if you look at, I believe it's table uh, A7 in the household data, which is uh, foreign born versus uh, natural born, uh, the for example, natural born male unemployment in the last year has gone from 4% to 4.2%. Um, the big jump is in uh, uh, foreign born men. So foreign born men has gone from 2.7% uh, last year. That was the unemployment rate for four, uh, foreign born men. It's now 4.2%. So most of that increase in the unemployment rate has actually been an increase in foreign born men unemployment rate. And that rate has gone up, not because jobs have gone down, but because the, the absolute number of foreign born workers available has gone up from 17.5 uh, million to 18.3 million. So we've had an increase in the foreign born workforce, which has led to an increase in the unemployment rate. And that's really why you're seeing the jobs numbers strong unemployment rate is simply going up because of an increase in foreign born uh, worker supply. That's interesting. George, I'm curious what your view is on the strength of the US economy and of the strength of the, the US labor market. You know, I, like many, I, I was swept up in the recession narrative of, of 2022. And there were, you know, reasons that made sense to me and a lot of people then. But with the benefit of hindsight, I mean, the US economy was adding half a million jobs every month. And the you know, credit card spending year over year was growing at 15%. It's, it seems almost ridiculous that there would be a recession. Obviously, it's easy to call when, you know, uh, two years after the fact. But now you're looking, as Mel said, the unemployment rate has, used to be 3.4%. It, now it went up to 4.1%, still very low. But as, as we know, just from looking at historical unemployment, when it goes up, it tends to go up a lot in a, in a nonlinear fashion. Spending, you know, the economy is, people are still spending a lot of money on an absolute basis, well above 2019 levels, well above trend. However, the growth rate, I'm looking at Visa, I'm looking at American Express, 6%, 7%. That's still a, a lot of spending. Of, of course, some of that is just growth on top of GDP because people are you know, using less cash uh, and that's you know, use of cash is in secular decline. But that's you know, indicating a growth rate much, much lower. And then inflation has fallen, which is obviously very good for stock, the stock market and assets. But that may indicate that the nominal boost from the economy of just the rip-roaring you know, 8% nominal GDP days are behind us. So how are you thinking about the economy? Would you acknowledge, as I think a, a lot of folks, uh, including people from the Federal Reserve, that there is a cooling in the labor market? They're not going to use uh, uh, explosive language like, uh, uh, you know, there's a there's a collapse or something, but that there is a there is a general cooling in demand for labor and in in demand for good. The, you know, the rate of change of growth is, is going down. What what are your thoughts about this economy, George? Well, for, first, uh, touch very quickly on the Fed. I, I think that's a uh, explanation trying to give them a reason to do something. Uh, it's a political um, point of view, and I, I think it's uh, just shy, if not propaganda. Um, the reality is what Mel said. Uh, we've had a massive inflow of illegals. Uh, I figure it's about a three million increase in the labor force. Uh, you can just see uh, if you graph it out that the uh, the household um, has gone down to pretty well flat growth uh, year over year rolling. Uh, well, non farm payrolls are are just maintaining a very strong uh, two and a half three percent rate. Um, it is basically impossible to have weakness in the labor market if you're having non farm payrolls at this clip. Now something might happen. I don't know. Asteroid falls on Detroit. I don't know. Uh, where the non-farm payroll does drop, but it has clearly momentum. And um, I, I think it's worth your while to figure out, well, why is non-farm payrolls uh, a runaway freight train? Um, why is it stymieing all these people who are coming up with saying there's labor weakness, including the little Fed, uh, when in fact uh, there's there's just no sign of it? And it, it shows up in terms of wages, which are still you know onwards and upwards, and as you pointed out, consumer spending. And uh, personal consumption expenditure. I'd like to add that I, I don't think it's the, the government is just on some uh, crazy ass uh, spend spree. There's two sides to it. Now, I, I almost feel I got to stand up in home each, I'm about to you know, cite Michael Pettis, but there's, there's a Ricardo identity that's always present, whether you're talking about the Fed monetary policy or international trade flows, or in terms of the US domestic economy, the deficit doesn't create the spend. The spend doesn't create the deficit. They're, they're actually an asset liability 
uh, that happens pretty well, sim uh, you know, simultaneously. Well, what do you mean by that, George? Explain that. Let's just pull back to um, how money, where money comes from in the banking system. It used to be that uh, uh, there was a key multiple, like, uh, you know, you, you, you decrease reserves, uh, then they would uh, multiply that out and that would create money. Now I think everyone agrees that the loan is the start of the money creation, not the other way around. Um, or at, um, they, they happen at the same time. You know, if JP Morgan increases its uh, commercial loans by uh, 500 million, uh, well, be JP Morgan being the credit that it is can can either receive through deposits or in the interbank market 500 uh, million uh, to cover that increase in loans, and that is an increase of 500 million in the money. Uh, same with the federal government. If the government uh, has a program, and and COVID was interesting because most of that money spend was immediate. It went and it was helicopter money. Uh, I think uh, Bernanke was just just chopping at the bit to actually have helicopter money enacted. Uh, it was ironic that it shows up with the federal government. And that went to the lowest cohorts. Uh, it, it went to the, 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 the schmoes who really need the unemployment insurance. Uh, they, they really needed that 600 bucks uh, a week that came through. Uh, and the upper cohorts didn't receive it. Uh, they, they got some PPP loans and such, but they really didn't receive the, uh, the majority of the of the immediate COVID remedy as far as uh, labor goes. Uh, but the upper cohorts were the ones who paid the tax bill. Um, it's well known that the top 20% pay like, I don't know, 80% of the taxes. Uh, so you had what was basically the largest redistribution of wealth. If you take into account that the forward value of tax receipts uh, has it can be put into a present value type footing. So therefore, you got the, the present value of the actual payouts. Um, and that is the redistribution of wealth. And it was massive. In fact, the, the gross amount was about $6 trillion. So if you get away from the, this idea of net and look at the, um, the actual distribution, uh, there was just a massive um, redistribution of wealth and just a, a, a almost a panic pump priming, which what it was, uh, to get consumption back up from the hoi polloi uh, to go out and buy McDonald's hamburgers and spend some money at Walmart. It worked. So it's probably a mistake to see it as a, um, as a net number. Uh, I think now we're getting towards more of a net number as industrial policy is replacing these COVID emergency remedies. But I don't see it as a as a as just a, a net flow in, in a spree uh, from Congress. Uh, so if you consider that redistribution and you consider the uh, just the sheer size of of the money, even not taking into account the redistribution of wealth that it, that it was, and if you look at just say the the industrial policy spending that's going on now, it's we have not had a government spend like this since World War II. And it makes sense because uh, for whether right or wrong, COVID was deemed an existential threat to the United States. So therefore, Congress suspended its usual uh, ways and means, its rules about mandatory discretion, and just gave it over to, at first, Trump, but then Biden, you know, save us. Spend, since this is existential, spend any amount that you, you think is required, uh, and we'll take a back seat and just deal with the consequences later. Uh, Congress has yet to reclaim, you know, their their constitutional role of control of the purse strings. It's still very much in the administration hands, and there's no sign of a stoppage of the spend. Now, where this ends up with risky assets is that I think it's important to uh, to understand that the the Fed was sidelined in World War II. Makes sense, you know. It it, uh, it was it was uh, that was the previous existentialist threat, and it wasn't until the 1951 Treasury Fed Accord that they came back into independence and started to have a, uh, you know, we're going to take the punch pull away when the party, before the party gets too weird. Well, the Fed is still, is still yet to do a uh, Trej Fed Accord of, uh, of 1951 phase two, uh, the, you know, the Trej Fed Accord of 2025 or so. Um, and the Fed, I think, is quite happy to take a back seat here, not so much for uh, monetary economic reasons, but just because they don't want to be holding holding the bag when this when this stuff falls apart uh, so they're, they're trying to shy away they, they and and that means that this is a a wartime spend 
that it is it would actually be unreasonable to think it does not show up in, in risky assets. Um, so it's it's not necessarily a a spend that is just a, a one sided equation. It's a dual sided balance sheet Ricardo type of identities. And if you spend you know like uh, let's say cumulative like six trillion now, you're going to get six trillion increase in GDP at least. Uh, not even counting, uh, you know, sort of a, any, any sort of uh, leverage in that, and that means risky assets will also increase about six trillion bucks as the debt is increasing. This time, it's in the public, uh, it's in the public sector. So, it, it's there's really no secret sauce, you know, detailed spiel. It's it's like a forget about the as broad as a barn door. It's like the barn fell on you. It, it it's. It's massive, and I'm I'm actually very confused as to why I'm called a contrarian, and why people look at it that way. When I'm I'm looking and say, you know, like I'm, I'm going like, D -d -d didn't you see the three trillion spend? Now, didn't you see that where it went? Don't you see what's going on with personal consumption expenditure or disposable personal income, or even net farm payrolls? Um, how can you go on and on with nuanced details, um, which basically often to me sound like gibberish? when we have these massive once every 70, 80 years events that are, are still playing out. For guidance is brought to you by Van Eck. The Van Eck Morningstar Wide Moat ETF, ticker MOAT, has outperformed the S&P 500 for over a decade. How? Moat strives to achieve a simple but challenging task. Buy quality stocks when they're undervalued and sell them when they're overvalued. Visit vaneck.com slash moat FG to learn more. That's vaneck.com slash moat FG. Now the disclosures. All investing is subject to risk, including the possible loss of money you invest. Visit vaneck.com to carefully read a prospectus before investing. The Vanek Morningstar Wide Moat ETF is distributed by Vanek Securities Corporation, a wholly owned subsidiary of Vanek Associates Corporation. Thanks. Let's get back to the interview. Okay, that, that makes sense to me. Uh, George, one thing economists might say is that it is about the rate of change. And yes, there is a huge step higher from 2019 to 2021 of nominal GDP and of spending. It, it, you know, we had a, you know, a one month depression and it took a while to get back there. But you know, things are above trend, above the trend line you would draw from, from 2019. I guess some economists might say it's about rate of change and it's about relative to where we are now. So there could be a recession that causes things to go down, but they still would be above 2019. So they say 2019 doesn't matter anymore. It's a, it's a distant memory. And I might propose to you the, the counterexample that I, I believe there was a recession in 1946 uh, after we had this huge government spending for the war that was very stimulative and the, the Federal Reserve was very accommodative with, with yield curve control. You said the Fed was sidelined in World War II I think you meant that their, their their central bank independence was definitely sidelined, but they played a, a pretty active role in in, in uh, you know pinning yields and keeping the government uh, expenditure uh, uh, low. Tell us about this this difference between absolute levels versus relative levels. First, I, I'd like to correct you that it wasn't just a one month to, you know recession. Um, it was clearly looking into the abyss of a depression if we hadn't had this emergency fiscal spend and uh, even monetary policy, but it was a budget uh, liquidity uh, rescue type of policy, not, not all this I completely agree. stuff. I completely yeah. agree. And also, I don't think you're you're representing correctly the, the how huge it was. It actually went on for three years. So there's your rate of change um, a discussion. At least it gets me out to like 2023 or 2022 for certainly, um, if not the first half of 2023. And then I, I think even now, uh, phase two of these industrial policies is very large. So there, there hasn't been a flagging or a change, and it, and it's, it's showing up with, um, with uh, you know, just uh, the Atlanta Fed GDP now to uh, the monthly uh, personal consumption expenditures, and uh, which we'll get this Friday, and and various other uh, metrics. Uh, GDP is booming. I don't think I don't know how people can say otherwise. In fact, I, I listen to the the popular views and I say, oh, I got to redo everything. I'm obviously out to lunch. Something I'm missing, and I redo all these like uh, programs and which breed like rabbits overnight. I think, and I come up with the same. Nope, it's still the same massive GDP growing. It's still the massive, uh, the very significant inflation still at three percent. There's still very significant. Um, uh, the labor force that matters that's resulting in still very significant wage growth, 
all of it uninterrupted, all of it showing not the slightest, you know, uh, as you say, rate of change that would matter, certainly in 2019 parlance, but but even now, just common sense. I think everyone's got to like take a breath and just look at the data and say, this is boom. Now, your 1946 um, uh, recession was actually about a million servicemen coming home, all in a very short order. Uh, so maybe it was similar to uh, the COVID pause, where everyone had to go home for a bit, but it was very quickly remedied as the servicemen weren't kept at home as in COVID. Uh, they immediately went out and got jobs and tried to resume their life. So I think it lasted like two weeks. And the Fed wasn't involved in monetary policy then. It was acting as the banker and the manager of the debt, which, of course, is a, is a Federal Reserve role. Um, but it certainly was not operating a, in any sort of monetary policy uh, framing. Uh, inflation was booming. They really didn't care about it. Uh, and it was definitely an arm of the Treasury. It, it really it had no independence. So that, to me, means there was no monetary policy. And why, why, you know, I mean, if the Fed went up to, uh, you know, FDR, then Truman and said, oh, we're going to tighten now, you know, they, they, you know, they would have been shot. Now it's the same thing, only it's for, uh, I think, political expediency and this wacky, this failure of this wacky neo Wicksell Woodford junk, uh, which is uh, also sidelined the Fed as far as monetary policy goes. So when you say there was no monetary policy during World War II, I think what, how I would put it is, I mean, we agree on the facts. How I would put it is there was no independent Federal Reserve deciding where interest should be in order to target growth or inflation or to achieve other aims. It, the monetary policy was set by the Treasury and, and politicians, not central bankers. I, I completely agree with that. Mel, what's your read on how the U.S. economy is faring and how the large U.S fiscal deficits are contributing to that. I do think it's interesting, you know, talking about the Fed a little bit and what their narrative is as they're coming out here and they're talking about risk coming more into balance. I think that is basically what they feel they need to say to justify cutting rates, which is what they want to do. I think if you look at uh, the, they had a, a public, uh, Kind of hearing or conference in central Portugal a few weeks ago. But immediately before that, the reason all these central bankers were in Europe was to attend a closed meeting at the Bank for International Settlements in Basel, Switzerland. It was the BIS's annual meeting. Uh, you know from prior conversations, this is where I believe a lot of the global monetary agenda gets harmonized and put into place. And I think the Fed needed a reason to cut rates because they just simply couldn't stomach uh, too much divergence between what Europe needed to do mm -hmm. and what the what uh, other central banks around the world need to do because they're going to be having a lot of you know debt resetting. So you know in countries like the UK where mortgages are not thirty year fixed, where they're going to be resetting soon, you're looking at what's happening from a growth standpoint in Europe. They need to cut rates and so. You know, the dollar was just going to get too strong. We had the yen getting up to, to 160. We had, uh, you know, these massive divergences. And you're, you, you've you seen since that Central Portugal meeting, you've seen the, the Dixie, the dollar index come down to around 104, I think it is now. You've seen 10-year uh, rates come down. And so all of this is being coordinated, I believe, to manage these these interest rates for reasons that don't have anything uh, much to do with the job market in the U.S., although they'll ostensibly say that's why uh, they need to uh, remove restraint. Um, I think you could argue, uh, as George does, that the Fed doesn't even matter. There isn't really any restraint. This is all kind of a shell game at this point. And so what impact will it have for the Fed to lower rates? Well, it does send a signal. It sends a signal um, kind of the lights go off and money managers like don't fight the Fed, buy equities, uh, buy small caps. Um, and I think that what you're seeing is kind of these Pavlovian responses to a perceived rate cutting cycle. And so I think the economy is on strong footing. You're not seeing massive spikes in initial claims. As I mentioned, I think the unemployment report is reflecting a lot of uh, increase in, in labor supply rather than an actual increase in, in unemployment of native born. Those are in the, in the numbers. 
And so we have a strong economy. We have strong fiscal uh, stimulus coming in the form of interest payments, front end, you know, uh, quantitative easing. You had a great show with Nuro Rabini and his colleague talking about ATI, active treasury issuance. So we're seeing all of these things, you know, feed the the asset bubble crescendo that I see. And, and I think along with all the other things I've talked about with, you know, automatic flows from payroll uh, disbursements, uh, government stimulus, we're, we're also seeing, you know, people that are in the treasury market, you know, start to squeeze out of that treasury market into other asset classes, whether it's Bitcoin, gold up over 2,400 and now it's again, uh, stock market indexes. And so we're, ju we're just seeing this massive kind of reshuffling where people are understanding that these, these bond rates are, I believe, you know, manipulated low. They're not where capital wants to be. And it's moving and creating these bubbles and other asset classes. And how are bond markets manipulated lower? I don't know if you mean the price is lower or the, the, the yield is lower. And then also a very interesting dynamic you alluded to, where if the rest of the world's economy is doing okay, but the US economy is doing much better, that the US economy can handle 5.3% interest rates on the Federal Reserve's overnight interest rate. But if Japan, you know, interest rates are still uh, zero and Europe cuts interest rates, Canada cuts interest rates, higher dollar denominated interest rates will draw money into the US and weaken other currencies. So in order to not have a, a, a lot of currency volatility and in order to not have the dollar strengthen, the Federal Reserve cuts interest rates to a level that it might not cut them if it just was thinking about its own domestic interest, uh, interest rates. And that kind of makes me think of a dynamic in the 1920s when the US economy was doing a lot better than the rest of the world and the uh, Federal Reserve did cut interest rates. And uh, that was during and you know later led to a giant uh, stock market bubble that everyone knows that popped in 1929. So, so Mel, you do think that interest rates set by the Federal Reserve actually do matter because that you and George agree on a lot, but that might be a, a point of difference between, between you two. I, I think there might be a slight difference there. I think, as I mentioned, I think they matter primarily as kind of a signal and they, they matter in, um, you know, the, the tone they're setting for risk appetite, uh, animal spirits, uh, th things of that nature. Uh, in reality, what they're doing with these higher rates, um, you know, they, since 2008 and the financial crisis, they now paying, you know, interest on reserves to the banks. And so, you, you know, you look at how the financial sector and the big banks have been doing, how their equity prices have been doing in the last six or 12 months. They've been doing fantastic, JP Morgan, Citigroup, uh, companies like this. And they're getting a massive, uh, basically, stimulus check from the Federal Reserve where they're they're borrowing from the people at, you know, 0.5% um, in people's checking accounts, and then they're getting over 5% from the Federal Reserve. So you, you're seeing that money go into the system. It's, it's, a, it's another form of, I believe, you know, stimulus. And so these higher rates that people say are restrictive, they're not actually being, you know, restrictive. And I don't think we've seen uh, a massive slowdown because we're 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 not actually uh, in some sort of a highly re restrictive phase right now. Thank you. So, so George, on how the economy responds to interest rates, there's the orthodox view that higher interest rates are, are, are a contractionary force. They slow down the economy because they constrain borrowing. That's a radically new view, but carry on. Okay, so that that is a that, that that's the current orthodoxy that the Federal Reserve definitely subscribes to. Then there's the other side of the argument that Mel alluded to, I would attribute you know, Warren Mosler with this view that actually high interest rates can be stimulative because people earn interest on the cash that they have. And then there's a view in the middle, perfectly in the middle, that it doesn't matter either way. Where on that spectrum are you? I'm in the middle, um, but noting serious flaws in Fed policy, uh, specifically uh, interest on uh, reserve balances and, and a few other things. Uh, I'm not going to debate with Moser. By God, that guy's five times prior to me, and and um, he's made a fortune, and it's, I don't know what he's doing for fun, but I, I'm not going to debate him. I do think he goes too far, uh, but that's another another show probably. What I would do is, again, I would take a, a Pettis point of view or a Ricardo one point of view is saying that as far as risk-free goes, uh, and there we might, as you know, I, I have a 
uh, at first I was very confused as to why U.S. Treasuries are not uh, behaving as per orthodoxy and as per doxology of, of economics formed together, you know, formed since you know the the turn of the 19th century. Uh, why they weren't behaving as they they had in the previous 40 years of my career uh, as of Jan 22. But letting that aside, uh, the risk-free curve of the United States is always pricing and reflecting NGDP uh, and what its expectations are. And if you think about the 27 to become 28 trillion GNGDP, if you think of the dollar block, if you think of the hegemon that the U.S. is, um, what that means is that, uh, of course, the risk-free rate will reflect NGDP's expectations. It, it can't be otherwise. Um, so I don't think interest rates are stimulative. I don't think they're uh, tightening. Um, I, I think they're just a pricing of the current status and a reasonable expectations of the, of the status going forward. So by NGDP, you mean nominal GDP, so uh, not adjusted for inflation. So if real growth is two and inflation is four, nominal GDP is six. And you, you are saying that the risk-free interest rates will also be six if nominal GDP is six, or if the market's pricing in nominal GDP of six over the next 10 years, that that's where the 10-year will be? I'm saying actually that the, the expectations of the short rate to a reasonable point, I don't know, four years, five years, and then a, uh, a well-understood uh, curvature uh, going back to a, a uh, to price uh, uh, both the convexity option that's in treasuries and also its, um, uh, its uh, duration risk add-on will, will occur. Um, why? Well, simply it's because it always has. Um, but uh, from Jan 2022, it's not happening. Uh, and yes, if, if you just look at, uh, and perhaps it, it's a pretty messy chart, but if you just look at NGDP since Volcker, uh, actually go back till, you know, since uh, uh, Eccles, um, NGDP and long treasuries, when we had them, uh, are, do reflect each other. Long treasuries meaning what, a 10-year, a 30-year, a five-year? What duration? Whatever we had at the time, 10-year, 20-year, 30-year, uh, then zeros, then strips. It, it, it's, it can't be otherwise. Because if you think about it, if, if NGDP is going on, at, at say, and it's reasonable expected to carry on with a 5% clip, then how is it possible that the cost of funding for the U.S. Treasury is like 4%? It's not possible. Or if the cost of funding for the U.S. Treasury would be 8%. It's not possible. Uh, this explains the very long bull market in bonds, the so-called, uh, since the, uh, you know, the 1982 peaks to, um, uh, to uh, just recently before we start to, to go up again. It just defies common sense that they would not be at least uh, in sync and if not priced um, if, if not having treasuries in the end being priced by uh, nominal GDP. Now, nominal GDP is all that counts. Real doesn't count. Real has been used for the last three years or so as a rabbit hole to escape when you're wrong. You know, like uh, I'm, I'm looking for a recession, but uh, I was right about real. Um, I'm looking for a labor to come off, but I was right about real. Uh, and they carry on. They're still doing it. Uh, real is only applicable for people making policy in terms of their concerns with productivity. Um, and it won't count until like uh, uh, JP Morgan starts paying earnings based on real. Like, okay, here's your dividend and it's the real dividend. You know, don't, you know, ignore the rest. Or if earnings are starting to be real, like, uh, you know, don't worry about our, our, our shortfall. Real earnings were actually up this year. It doesn't happen. Uh the, also, the thing is that real only counts when you're assuming that the Fed funds has power such that it can rein in uh, excessive nominal add to real. Um, if the Fed can't do that, then it, it's, not, it's, it, it's, it's almost a waste of time to look at real. So I definitely grant you that uh, a lot of folks who've been calling since for recession since 2022 or even 2021 – will isolate data points that make their case look stronger and say, oh, I actually was right about this. I was, I was right about that. However, I'm not sure that the real GDP, you know, people are looking at, you've been calling for a recession and it hasn't happened. 
are pointing to real GDP because actually what's been falling is nominal GDP growth because inflation has fallen. What's been really bullish is real, real GDP has gone up. It, real GDP slowed to almost zero in 2022 because inflation was so high. Again, real is inflation adjusted for, for our audience. But as inflation has fallen and nominal GDP fell way less, real GDP spiked up. So you're, you're having a, um, a, a bit of a, a boom. But George, I just want to get on the, the timeline of the connection between the 10-year treasury, the five-year treasury, the, the 30-year treasury, pick wherever you want on the curve, and nominal GDP. Are you saying that for a five-year treasury, if let's say in you know 1980, 1980 the five-year treasury at 13%, that was pricing a 13% nominal GDP growth over the next five years, or that it was reflecting the GDP over the past year from 1979 to 1980, because I understand how you know nominal GDP and the uh, treasury rate are very correlated in the same way that maybe earnings on the S&P 500 are correlated to earnings, uh, the, the level of the S&P 500. Uh, however, the, the timing is off. Like the S&P 500 started booming in April, you know, late March 2020, but you, di you didn't see the earnings until later. So there's definitely a, a lag. So could you just clarify, you know, is, is the bond market pricing in the future or is it reflecting the past when you say that? Okay, so I don't get to dig into earnings. That's another one of my favorite uh, canaries. Okay, but uh, treasuries, it's, it's just, uh, as I said again, it's dogma. It's, it's, it's orthodox. Uh, and be it far from me to be bright enough to figure out why Keynes and Arrow and that, well, you know, I just go on with a list of people uh, are wrong. And I'm right saying that that is not the relationship now. I, I can't nullify it, all the or anything like that. Um, U.S. Treasuries and the curve always reflects or is not priced by NGDP. Now, there was this, uh, uh, since Volcker, there's this curveball, which is like, what the hell is the Fed going to do? You know, tighten, loose, and all that stuff, which does show up into the curve out to about three years um, uh, it, at most, but usually it stops at about two years. That's why the two years really moving in, in an interesting ways now. Uh, versus Fed funds and bills, uh, despite this idea that bills are created. Anyway, I'll get into that. That is has to be priced in. But once you get past the two years, or let's say the three years, um, the curve and the 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 U.S. Treasury rate until January of 2022 uh, was always one and the same with NGDP expectations. So it, expectations, it just, not reflecting the past, but pricing in the future. Okay, pricing in the future. Now, if if the popular, if not even the popular, if the if the um, expectations are that uh, holy cow, we're going to get it and get it good, that you know, COVID two is coming. I know there's all sorts of various reasons as to why NGDP, despite its current uh, growth, is going to like just fall on its ass, and that will be reflected in the curve. However, when people have three or four years or even decades of NGDP. Um, trend, which is not really, which is probably very difficult to say that, it, you know, it's only going to fall on its ass because I can't find the event. I can't find the cause for that. So why not what's happened for the last 50 years carry on? Uh, then U.S. Treasuries until January 2022 were one in the same uh, past the three years to like, say, 10 years and 30 years uh, as expectations for GDP. Um and, uh, you know, if you want to really dig into it, you got to let me run away and I'll come back with my bodyguards, Arrow, Keynes. You know, I, I got a pretty tough squad that will protect me. But from January of 2022, and I think it came from the New York Fed, and I, came, I think it came from um, Williams and this crowd who, who were really, they're on the battlements. They're, they're, they're out there to defend this Neil Wick cell as long as it goes. Uh, extended the idea of the natural rate. And again, this is, this gets more complex, not just from Fed funds out to like, say, three months or so, which is the past. They, they extended it right out to 30 years. They went into yield curve control. Um, and Bernanke mentions this when he talked to Japan in tw uh, 2002 and then later right to 2004. So it, it makes sense that this is how they think. A huge error, uh, because what it does is it destroyed price discovery. It divorced the U.S. Treasury rates and curve now from what is going on with NGDP, it forces many, many people to fly blind. 
if not make a really crass error, and they keep making it. You know, they, they, they say, oh, my gosh, what's the New York Fed model doing on recession probability? Oh, still, like, you know, 40% chance of having a recession. So I'm, who am I to say the New York Fed's wrong? I'm, I'm going to stick with it. It's, it's a recession probability. This is just, rather than people just say, like, good gosh, we've been wrong for, for two years now. Not just sort of wrong. I mean, just laughably wrong. Um, and we're still at it. We're still looking for secret sauce in terms of like labor's dropped off, like uh, uh, various people or this or that or that or, you know, everything trying to figure out why the asteroid's going to hit Detroit. And rather than just say, you know, I think two years of trend is sort of like challenging everything I believe about U.S. treasuries and the economy. You know, certain bright folks who are pragmatic, uh, guys that are very expert, like you, you've talked to them, like in options and, and the equity market are starting to say, mm, maybe we don't quite have this right. Um, you know, or they're just moving on and, and, and dropping all the macro guys with their inputs. Uh, so where does this leave us is that I think we're going to get a resounding return of what I call orthodoxy and doxology. Um, but there's going to be a very bitter battle at the Federal Reserve to maintain the current uh, status quo. Um, so I don't, I don't know if that, uh, uh, I tend to wonder, come on, Jack, do your job and keep me in line. Um, <laughs> I, I know I do tend to wonder. So the five-year treasury, the 10-year treasury yield reflects expectations, market expectations of what nominal growth will be over that time period. I can totally wrap my head around that in the same way that the stock market reflects expectations of what earnings will be. You know, out until infinity, discounted by the future. But George, will, would you grant that expectations can be wrong in the same way you know, ex earnings expectations for the stock market were very rosy in 1999 and 1929, and they were wrong? Um, in the same way, you know, the the top tick of the 10-year Treasury at 17% in 1981, nominal growth from 1981 to 1991 was way way lower than that. So that the expected nominal GDP often differs from the real GDP. And likewise, in the from you know the mid 1960s to the 1970s, nominal GDP ran sustainably above the expectations priced into the five year or the 10 year. I mean, I just I just pulled up that that chart. So would you grant that they have expectations, but there are discrepancies because oftentimes, in, in some cases, most of the time, the market's wrong. I would disagree with that. And this is why now I'm going to dive back into the real rabbit hole, like everyone else. In 81, 82, uh, it was obvious that uh, there was a punitive level of Fed funds being applied, all which which Taylor late, later codified, but not, not until like 10 years later, to just wring inflation out of the economy. Um, and it was a lot, it was an experiment. Uh, th there were a little rough edges to it. So what you're seeing was not the expectations for NGDP in terms of like the economy's growing. Uh, clearly it was below it, but there are expectations for what the Fed's response was going to be given the inflation which was showing very little response to this, uh, you know, trying to wring its neck uh, that Volcker was applying. Um, I think a more obvious uh, illustration of what I'm saying would be, you know, I don't know, post post 90s, uh, 1990s on, uh, or 88 even on. Uh, and there, what I'm saying about NGDP, both real and nominal, uh, it would make a lot more sense and be a much more cleaner picture. Yes, I'm. I'm looking at that chart, and uh, I imagine you know the a lot of your career from the 1990s to the mid 2000s. That does make sense. Nominal GDP. 1981 to yeah. 2000. But go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But the the nominal GDP it was very in line with nominal uh, 10 year Treasury bond rates, the risk free rate during the 1990s. But there. You know, there were discrepancies in the 1960s, the 1970s, and the 1980s, and there are discrepancies now. Um, as I pointed out to you before, you know, in, in 2021, the 10-year was at 1.5%. And I would be shocked if nominal GDP over the next, you know, from 2021 to 2031 is that low. I mean, we've already had nominal GDP of just you know above 6%, 7%. So there are discrepancies. So I wonder why do you say that always it always, always I, I grant you, sure, there are periods where they are very correlated, like the 1990s, the early 2000s. But there also are periods such as Volcker, the 1970s, where there are discrepancies. Why not just say it's complicated? Sometimes the theory works, sometimes it doesn't. Why say always the risk-free rate is 
you know, uh, not only GDP rate expectations are reflected in the risk rate. I'm going to stick with always. Uh, and the reason I will is, um, first of all, I can't make sense of anything unless I say always. I, and I, I mean, in terms of like late 80s, 90s, the odds, 2000, after GFC, nothing makes sense unless you understand this risk-free rate is reflective of um, NGDP expectations. Second, uh, when I say it's out to the three years, five years, what's more important is the curve. Uh, the curve should be perceived once you adjust it for in, in, you know, um, duration risk and, and various other bond uh, uh, mechanics of its math. It's the how much acceleration is going on in the economy. So if the term premium, uh, which is perhaps a much more important way to talk about the curve and rather than outright yield, uh, the term premium shows um, how much uh, how much accelerant, how much growth is being priced into the market. First, because the term premium is is uh, rather stable. You know, as you know, the curve uh, you know goes up and goes down and uh, has various shapes. But uh, the term premium is rather constant, um, are are stable once you get past uh, like two years, three years. Uh, but I'm not cheating. I'll still stick that NGDP uh, is reflected in the end, uh, you know, in the end we're all dead, but in the end to uh, U.S. Treasury rates, but for when the Fed has gotten its mind to increase its balance sheet from like 800 billion to 8 trillion, um, that's a lot of bonds trading. And the Fed has clearly shown, uh, you know, since it was created, that they can set Fed funds. That's a risk-free rate. You know, they, they can say, you know, Fed funds now at three, we're now making it six. So it makes sense that if they have the same amount of, of trading interaction, not so much uh, demand supply, but interaction, they can actually meet in a room and say, ah, this is where we want the 10 years. Um, and I think that's what's happened uh, right from uh, first in a clumsy, probably, uh, you know, oh, look at that way. But by January, 2022, they really fine tune it, and the yield curve is set. U.S. Treasury ten year is set. Uh, it has nothing to do with demand supply. It has nothing to do with like T bills versus long bonds and all this sort of stuff. It's got to do with the fact that the Fed, some bright guys, sit down um, and say, "Ah, we think we don't want the ten year much higher than five percent," and away they go. George, I'm having trouble with the claim that simultaneously the Fed reserve doesn't matter, and then also. Not only do they control the short-term interest rate, which is an objective fact, but they control the entire yield curve. And also, how could they control the entire yield curve without demand and supply? If they do quantitative easing to buy a bunch of 10-year notes, they would be increasing the demand in the market. If they indicate to the market that they're going to keep interest rates low and that that increases private sector demand to buy treasuries, how does the Federal Reserve control the 10-year? And how is it not through demand and supply? And if they do control the entire treasury market, how does that not have a huge effect on the economy? If anything, it it, um, it reinforces my view, uh, because if the Fed, for whatever reasons, uh, and we'll get into how, but for whatever reasons, divorce the U.S. Treasury 10-year, let's just take the 10-year, from what's going on in the economy, then they're even isolating themselves more and making them more themselves more uh, ineffective and uh, a, a non sequitur in terms of like, you know, what's going on with fiscal and the economy. Uh, they're they're actually uh, putting themselves into a, a isolated fort, if you will, uh, that makes them more irrelevant, not uh, are, you know, rather than more important. U.S. Treasuries are big; There's, they're they're very big. But if you look at like how much are our foreign identities, like what what uh, Pettis was talking about, if you look at how much is uh, asset liability management, like they will buy ten years no matter what happens. So, you know, if you're MetLife or Calpers. Uh -huh. uh, if you look at how much is autopilot, um, basically passive before uh, Mike Green started talking about passive. And if you look at uh, what, what actually is the tradable 10 years, it's a very small amount, uh, considering the, the amount of issuance and the amount of um, uh, float that's out there, if, if there is such a thing. The, tra the Fed, if, if let me put it to you, um, and, and uh, I'll probably keep talking anyway, but if the Fed can control Fed funds, and I think you granted that the Fed can say Fed funds are eight, Fed funds are two, and that's a risk-free market rate, 
why the hell can't they control 10 years now when they're in the market for 40 billion? Uh, that's not even counting the, you know, the Treasury, you know, Fed, your agency, you know, go out and buy 20 billion or whatever the heck uh, they're doing. So they, they have about at least a 60 billion reason to be in the marketplace. So just like Fed funds, uh, you know, the, the, the open market trading desk, uh, you know, the, the, the system oper operation, sorry, the SOMA guys mm -hmm. call up uh, JP Morgan. They say, hi, we're going to buy 2 billion 10 years at four and three eighths. And we're going to sell uh, two billion uh, old ten years or seven years at four and a quarter. Presto, bingo! Uh, that's the set rate. It's, it has nothing to do with the economy. It has to do with the whims or the the uh, the understanding of the Fed on what should be done. Um, it, it it is not a, a macroeconomic rate anymore. Okay, so they would do some sort of uh, operation twist thing. The I think the Federal Reserve exact term was the maturity extension program where holding the balance sheet constant, but they sell their two-year things to buy the 10-year notes. Uh, I think you're giving the Federal Reserve more power than I, I might even attribute to them in terms of controlling the entire Treasury yield curve. And then you know your view, which that the risk-free rate for the United States is not the U.S. Treasury market. It is the agency mortgage-backed security market. You know, that is a claim, is an interesting claim, but the U.S. mortgage-backed security market rates there and the U.S. mortgage market are very dependent and very correlated with the ten-year Treasury rate. I mean, what it's it's prices spread above the the, the ten-year or the option-adjusted spread, and you know that it's it's anywhere from basically from zero to one hundred and fifty basis points, and you know that's not a lot compared to where the ten-year went from one point four percent to to five percent. But so, but we will explore that that theory in, in full. But I want to just bring Mel back into the conversation. Mel, during our first interview two to three months ago, you, you spoke very highly about. George's theory that the U.S. risk-free rate is not the treasury market, it is the mortgage-backed security market, the mortgage market. Why do you find so much explanatory power there? And, and what are your, your, your thoughts on this, as well as anything we've discussed over the past 15 minutes? You know, George could probably explain it better, but obviously he has pointed out that when you look at, you know, which, which are basically full faith and credit-backed bonds, you know, the mortgage uh, security market, and when you look at something like a 30 year fixed and you think about, you know, because of prepayment risk or what have you, it tends to actually be a pretty good proxy for like a 10 year duration or a 10 year note. Um, and you look at what that's trading at. So if you look at that now, for example, it's at about 6.9% uh, where you have a 10 year at four and a quarter. And if you go kind of prior COVID, that spread was much less. And so that spread, um, in a way is giving a tell on what the real risk-free curve would likely look like. Um, why would I think that that's, you know, important is I think that you have a lot of uh, funny business just going on in the treasury market, whether it's the amount of bill issuance versus coupons, whether it is changes that are being made to capital requirements at banks. I think one of the big sticking points with the Basel III endgame uh, regulations was the amount of increase they wanted in, in capital ratios. Um, there was the March of 2024 letter from the International uh, Swaps and Derivatives Association asking for treasuries not to count against bank uh, supplementary reserve ratios. And so basically you're seeing the banking system writ large trying to find ways where they can stuff treasury treasury issuance because they know so much treasury issuance is coming down the line. And I think that was where we could, you know, where I would take this a little bit of, well, what's going to happen going forward? And I think whether we had a have a Kamala Harris president or a Donald Trump president, and you listen to all of the policies and what they're proposing, that the, the federal government, the powers that be, if you will, they have become addicted to these large deficits. They have industrial policy that's inflationary. If you look at, you know, tariff policy, it's inflationary. If you look at uh, green climate policy, that's inflationary. And so all of these down the road, I think, in a sense, the market's making a little bit of a mistake right now with with treasuries down at four and a quarter is there 
they're, they're starting to buy into this narrative that the jobs market is weakening, that inflation is, is, is uh, moving nicely towards its path to 2%. And I think that's essentially could p- possibly kind of suck people into that narrative. And I think that will ultimately be proven wrong. I think what we're in is a little bit of a lull. We're in a little bit of a period where through various manipulations, such as you know more bills than notes, um, we're seeing the treasury, the longer end of the curve, artificially low, and it's low uh, as evidenced by you know mortgage back rates. And I mean, George also, I've seen him do slides. Maybe he could talk about it, where he's looked at. I believe it's a way to derive what the ten year should be, some sort of an F line. I've seen, and you've seen like a a, a perfect corollary between the actual ten year and what this predicts. And except for in periods of high trauma, like the great financial crisis, the peak of COVID. But then you saw about a year, year and a half ago, you saw a divergence um, between the predicted 10 year and what it actually was in a way you hadn't really seen in the past. So, George, I mean, I don't know if you wanted to talk about that, but what is going on to create that divergence and why when you look at it through the mortgage backed lens, you see that even with this recent decline of, say, mortgage rates from high sevens to high sixes, um, you're also seeing at the same time a reduction in, say, the two year. And so you're continuing to have this fairly steep uh, risk free curve, the risk free curve uh, being differentiated in our view, I guess, from the Treasury curve. George, there's some some things uh, Mel mentioned that that I'm not in accord with, but and I also I think I, I, I failed you, Jack, in, in communicating. I don't see mortgage-backed securities as the risk-free rate. Um, I don't think there's this transference from U.S. Treasury 10 years and suddenly it's now mortgage-backed securities. My approach, uh, somewhat of desperation beyond my mathematical ability, is to bootstrap out where the U.S. Treasury 10-year would be if the Fed wasn't goofing around with it. Um, and looking and trying to find, okay, where is there a risk-free uh, presence in the markets that of such a size that has no choice but to deal with NGDP and the economy ongoing? And that, of course, is the mortgage industry. Uh, you know, the mortgage rate has to be at some sort of equilibrium. Otherwise, it just wrecks havoc. You know, we end up with a, a GFC, too, as, you know, uh, uh, goofy rates uh, promote too hot a, a home market or too low. Uh, Fed will not allow that. Congress won't allow that ever again. So therefore, the 30-year mortgage rate has an oar in the water in terms of what the actual economy is. And then there's obviously well-known, uh, um, uh, first, the tax credit that everybody who goes and buys a house gets with their mortgage. Uh, the U.S. wants you to buy a house. The U.S. government, that's been a policy ever since Levittown, uh, you know, post-World War II. Um, and at the same time, mortgage-backed securities created in the early 80s um, are clearly risk-free, you, you know, such that the Fed itself says they're risk-free. You know, that's why mortgage-backed securities are part of the allowed securities that they can go in and do QE and QT on. Yeah, so we're talking about agency securities issued by Fannie Mae, Ginny Mae, Freddie Mac, not the private label mortgage-backed securities no. that caused the great financial crisis, just to be clear. Yeah. Right. Not talking about AAA and, and option arms and all the other stuff, which uh, unfortunately I know too well. I don't think anyone would argue with saying that Fannie Mae current coupon is risk-free. Uh, the Fed doesn't argue with that. They, they say it's risk-free. So therefore, there should be a relationship between the U.S. Treasury 10-year and Fannie Mae current coupon um, mortgage-backed securities which was the case. Uh, yeah, there's odd times where, as, as Mel points out, where there's stress and they diverge, but it was always a very short-term thing. Uh, you know, after the crisis, after the GFC, most exciting couple months or, or uh, COVID, uh, they would come back a line because if you think about it, if, if U.S. Treasury 10 years are doing their job, they have to be in sync with the mortgage-backed securities because that in turn is based on 30-year conventional, which means that it's all, it sort of proves out what I'm saying that US Treasury 10 years did reflect NGDP expectations and evolution at that time, because that's what, of course, mortgage backed securities have to reflect. So, bootstrapping that, I come up with where the US Treasury 10 year would have been 
for various reasons. Now, I haven't really, uh, you know, I, I, I just went off in a, you know, in a, in a, a tirade in terms of why it's happening, but I don't really know. But what I do know is the U.S. Treasury 10-year has consistently, not just in terms of a moment of, of duress and, and challenge, no longer reflected the U.S. risk-free 10-year rate uh, as shown by mortgage-backed securities. And then also we can look at, at AAA corporates. We can look at, you know, there, there's various other almost risk-free that we can look at, and all of them have diverged uh, significantly from uh, U.S. Treasury 10 years. Now, all the all the models for like figuring out the yield curve and U.S. Treasury 10 years um, are based on a no arbitrage. You, you read about it and it hurts your head. It's pretty complex stuff. I think I'm starting to get to grips with it, but it was always characters up on the 13th floor that could, you know, do this for me. Um, now I got to do it myself, especially to back up what I'm saying. Otherwise, I'm just full of it. So, but the models, um, all of them, Holy, Nelson Siegel, blah, blah, blah. There's a whole bunch of them. They always seek a no arbitrage conclusion. That means that the U.S. Treasury 10-year has to be in proximity, if not equal, to what the model comes up with. So they they start with a short rate. They start with a sense of volatility. Uh, but that's just to map out how the short rate ends up at the U.S. Treasury 10-year rate. It's often called a theta. And everyone's happy. But those models, all they, they don't solve to mortgage-backed securities. They don't solve to anything else. All they do is... Uh, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy to how they solve to the U.S. Treasury 10-year rate since January of 2022. I keep saying January 2022 because it's important. Um, and that, of course, is what the New York Fed is doing with its probability recession models. And that is what I think is the source of, uh, you know, it's not just 9 out of 10, uh, you know, 95 out of 100 of macroeconomists and all are making this error because they're still – keyed into what their habit was, which is to not mess with the guys on the 13th floor, just use their stuff. And the yield curve always gives a good example of GDP development. So the whole probability of recession, which is behind everyone's bearish view, whether they know it or not, is based on my thought that GDP is always reflected in U.S. Treasury tenure. Um, you, you know, you, you can't have it both ways. Yet, that model stopped working from January 2022 on for whatever reasons. Um, maybe there's an international, you know, Basel three bat conspiracy or something like that. Uh, just have a fun mail. Or, or maybe there is a, a uh, I don't know, a, you know, a Masonic order that's decided that this, I, I don't know. I think it's just like Williams and two guys got together and say, well, we got to extend the Neo Wixell natural rate out the whole curve just to make us right. Um, but for whatever reason, the U.S. Treasury tenure is consistently not the risk-free rate for the nation. Um, and uh, that's the basis of my... Now, as soon as you come to this conclusion, you end up with a very powerful... Or, or actually, you end up return, being able to use the very powerful tool that people use for 40 years to understand macroeconomics, which is the risk-free curve. And then also, you start to make sense of what might happen uh, given how this has not just traditionally, but, but mathematically has foresight in terms of what the economy is going to do, but you do not have it with U.S. Treasury tenures. Um, that being the case, uh, you're, you're, I, think, I think what I'm boiling down to is that there's always a risk-free curve. It doesn't matter what the hell is U.S. Treasury are doing. There's time to time where there's been um, – uh, sector segmentation, usually uh, operation twist. Uh, you know, the World Bank was only allowed to buy out the five years. Uh, uh, Peter Fisher got in his head that he's going to eliminate the long bond and that will drop rates. Um, and then QE and every single academic examination of that. Uh, I lived through the World Bank's five year limitation uh, resulted in a temporary five basis points to maybe 12 basis points change in that specific sector that was experiencing the biggest impact of that sector segmentation origin. So it, it, it just, it means that there's always one risk-free rate. And the Fed itself says that. They say that, well, okay, we're at 5.3, but uh, they, they can call it either the natural rate or the neutral rate, but that's around 3% now. 
Uh, you can say that it's 3% because you believe in neutral rates. I like what's the rate that that will not upset labor and also, um, uh, you know, contain inflation, uh, a la Taylor and others, that's 3%. Or you can say, no, the Wix cell natural rate is 3%, but it, there's a rate, 3%. So that 3% rate is the same for five years, 10 years, or 30 years. And let me, let me really blow your mind, the 10 years actually trading at that 3% rate, the five years already tr is trading at that 3% rate, and the 30 years trading at the 3% rate. Now, Warren Mosler would say, well, it should be zero. But anyway, there is only one rate. Now, to have that 5%, that five-year rate equivalent to overnight Fed funds are the, are, you know, the 3% natural rate or neutral rate, there has to be adjustments for duration and convexity, and that's the yield curve. Um, so the actual tradable five-year rate is, I don't know, you know, three and a half to 4% given convexity, uh, option, you know, various other inputs, but it is actually the 3% risk adjusted rate, um, for every point in the curve. Um, and, uh, when you start thinking of it that way, then you can start to, I think then you can start to judge what the feds doing or not doing. You can judge the impact of fiscal, and you can start to get some foresight in terms of where the economy is going to go. Hello, everyone. Permissionless 3 is coming to Salt Lake City on October 9th. The event for crypto natives is heading west, and we are bringing the biggest names in crypto together for an insane, can't-miss event. Hear from more than 200 industry titans, including Balaji, Mike Novogratz, and Dan Tapiero. The conversations at Permissionless will be covering the hottest themes in crypto, including modularity, restaking, the Bitcoin and Solana ecosystems, AI and crypto, rollups and L2s, institutional adoption, and of course, the November election that will be right around the corner. We couldn't be more excited about this event. Get your ticket today and make sure I get some bragging rights by using my code FG10 to get 10% off. That's FG10, stands for Ford Guidance. I wanna see you there, do it. It's gonna be at one of the most beautiful places in the United States and everyone's gonna be there. Van Spencer's gonna be there. Jim Bianco's gonna be there. Jan Van Eck's gonna be there. So what are you waiting for? Get your tickets now by clicking the link in the description and use code FG10. Back to the episode. So George, you've forgotten more about the bond market than I'll ever know. But as you know, the duration of, of a mortgage or a mortgage-backed security, how long it takes to get paid back, but also how that value of that instrument changes with interest rates that itself changes. So for example, in 2020, when interest rates were very, very low, the Fed cut interest rates to zero and mortgage rates collapsed. So many people were refinancing their mortgage. That means they paid off mortgages that already existed. As a result, the CPR conditional prepayment rate of uh, in, in mortgage-backed security pools was like 40%. So 40% of the market refinanced. And as a result, the duration of that market, I'm just pulling it up right now, was two. So that, you know, two years um, so you can kind of equivalent that to a two-year treasury, but now you have to price that off of a 5.5-year treasury because that's what the S&P mortgage-backed securities index is, 5.5. And I'm also, the reason that the spread is high is because fixed income vol implied volatility is high. Like the, the uh, option-adjusted spread is only 35 basis points, but the option is valuable because the market is still pricing a chance that the Fed cuts rates and that rates go up and down and sideways. In other words, fixed income volatility is, is very high. How does that feature into your framework? The way it has been dealt with since Bernieri invented mortgage-backed securities is ignored. Um, in saying, uh, yeah, you're right. It could be five years, it could be three years, it might be 15 years. Uh, it moves all over the place. But the prepayment option is the big driver. Um, but it's never it's never a, a function of the risk-free rate. Uh, the the uh, tax impact and also the um, uh, the fact that mortgage-backed securities are risk-free is not the issue. So what you're saying is that mortgage-backed securities can be somewhat like a two-year risk-free rate or a five-year risk-free rate or a 10-year risk-free rate, uh, but that's, that's not material to what my argument is. In the past, what in Fannie Mae, everybody, every mortgage-backed securities, they just say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they'll adjust it, maybe do a little more futures, less futures, but they'll just say it's 10 years. And that's the basis of communicating to each other. Uh, and that's the spread that they run. What they're more interested in is what's the cost of trans, 
um, of uh, transforming a 30 year a block of home loans, uh, you know, uh, 500 million of all these 30 year conventional mortgages of like, you know, some are 29 and a half years, some are, are 30 years fresh to a current coupon mortgage backed security. And that's, that's about a, a consistent, uh, uh, I think it's about 140 basis points or so, uh, 130. And that, that's, mm-hmm. been, that's been unwavering. Um, it's still now there. It was there in, in 1992. Um, there's sometimes when FICO scores uh, are really dashed, uh, and that's because then people can't borrow. So therefore the pipeline um, uh, becomes greatly lessened and people have to get a certain amount of mortgage-backed securities in their books. Uh, so therefore the, the, the cost of production might, might increase as whole loans become more valuable um, uh, because of those change in credit. But those are again only short-term changes. So, what you're saying correctly um, really doesn't doesn't upset my approach to trying to bootstrap where the U.S. Treasury ten-year is uh, given. Now, if the fives to ten years curve were to grossly invert, like you know we're, we're talking about like you know seven percent down to three percent, you know it's, it's something that hasn't happened, or well, I guess it could happen, then I'm out to lunch. Uh, or I have to change my bootstrapping and start to say, okay, I got to start using where's the five year. Um, but as far as the U.S. Treasury um, curve being out of sorts with the economy, such that it's disconnected, I say, uh, and of no bearing to the economy, which is what I also say, um, uh, I, I think I think it's planned. Uh, I don't want to say that the Fed is so freaking incompetent that they don't even know what they're doing. So I, I, th- I think they're very bright guys. They really know the asset market. So I think they want this curve to be flat to slightly inverted, and they want the risk premium to be negative to, to flat. Um, Why? I think that's a plan. Why? I think it's a signal. Um, I think these, uh, you're, you really got to respect these Neil Wicksell fellas that, and, and Bernanke himself said it, he said QE is a signal. Uh, yes, in the end, it's just been reserve management. But really what it is, is the Fed communicating, we are so serious that we're going to buy $2 trillion of treasuries. And how can that not but be a huge impact on the U.S. economy? It's $2 trillion. Um, and then Bernanke himself would say, it's a signal. Um, the whole uh, Delphic and Odyssean type of, of, of spiels that came out of trying to like dummy down uh, Neil Wicksell Woodford to the common man, uh, so they used mythology, I uh, also said it's a signal. It's 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 a desire to it, it's not a desire. It's it's to seek a powerful, adamant commitment that forward expectations are for guidance will end up as reality because we are damn serious. And if you think two trillion is not enough, we're going to take this guy. To, we're going to take it up to eight trillion. Don't mess with us. Uh, and I think that's what that logic and that approach is. They they. They sort of exhausted everything. So they said, well, you know, the Fed funds going up in this discrete gradualism style, uh, which never was a tightening, ain't doing anything. So why don't we just use our knowledge of Neil Wicksell and drop U.S. Treasury 10 years so we have a flat curve and that will be a, an effective tightening or, or something or other or a signal. I think that's what they're doing. So, George, you think the 10 year Treasury at 4.25 percent is lower than it would be if it wasn't being manipulated by the Federal Reserve. My words, not yours, but I think that is what you're saying. But then how do you square that with quantitative easing has no impact or it only you know, lowers it by five, 10 basis points? And as well as the Federal Reserve right now is doing quantitative tightening. So it's letting assets roll off its balance sheet. It's reducing its balance sheet. Wouldn't that uh, force yields up, not down? No, because it's, it's not a manipulation. It's a rate setting. It's the same mentality as to, I'm sure you allow that the Fed can take Fed funds to wherever they want. Uh, they decided that, why don't we just do this for 10 years? So if this wasn't going on, the impact on the risk-free rate, like the, the four or five basis points or 10 basis points I mentioned, does show up in mortgage-backed securities, uh, so adjusted to bootstrap into what the risk-free rate is, but it is immaterial to where the U.S. Treasury 10 year is right now. But okay, but so George, the the way the the actual policy rate is the federal funds rate, but the way that the Federal Reserve 
controls that is by paying interest on reserves, so interest on reserves, as, as well as the repo rate and the reserve repo rate to have that floor. So that, that changed um, after the great financial crisis. But the, a, a tenure, someone who owns a 10-year treasury rate is not being paid by the Federal Reserve. They're being paid by the treasury. So the Federal Reserve would have to manipulate or change the price of that yield. So how is the Federal Reserve setting the 10-year treasury yield? Well, again, Fed funds are not set by you know, the pressures of interest rates. Fed funds are set because the system open market desk calls up and says, we hereby, actually they say it. I mean, they, they you know, the Fed meeting and the instructions to the system open market rates is that Fed funds here on will be changed from 5% to 5 and 3 eighths percent. It's just edict. Uh, and nobody, nobody looks at like how they do it uh, or like flow funds or any of that sort of stuff. They say, well, you know, when the Fed wants Fed funds to be at, at X, it will go at X. Um, you know, nobody argues with now, especially in this day and age where there's not a massive amount of um, of uh, scarcity and reserves that have to be bought in and sold. Uh, it, it's just it's just a, it's it's not a manipulated rate. It's an administrated rate. Yeah, because the Federal Reserve is the one paying the interest, not on the federal no, but, funds rate, but on the very, very similar reverse repo rate, uh, interest re- reserve rate. But the, the, the lender in this case is not the Federal Reserve, it's the Treasury for, the te- for all Treasury security. So how does the Fed, Federal Reserve do that? Well, first, the Treasury, um, had the Fed does all, is the agent for every single Treasury purchase and sale. Uh, it goes to the Fed. They, even despite the buyback that Yellen announced, they have this massive reason to be in the market, just as they have this big reason in Fed funds uh, to enter the U.S. Treasury market. So therefore, the Fed administers the ten-year rate by, by doing what, George? By doing what? They, they as, again. I, I, I think I'm repeating myself. They, they'll call J.P. Morgan or whatever dealers. You know, the whole myriad. Actually, they call everyone at once. Um, whatever the Fed time is now, I don't know what it is, but they'll call everyone at once and they'll say, "Hi, just in the in this interest of transparency, we are going to buy billions at." Five at four and a quarter, and tomorrow we're going to be back in the market, and we're going to sell not quite a billion, but we're going to sell more than enough at uh, at uh, four and a quarter, and we're going to keep doing this until you get the drift. And just like Fed funds, they get the drift. I mean, who are you to argue with the, that? You know, four and a quarter is too low. And George, are are you seeing that? You're looking at the Fed Reserve's balance sheet when it is released every single instance, and seeing that because. I- I think in terms of what the Federal Reserve has indicated with its statements, the Federal Reserve Board of Governors, that it is not doing that. It has made no statement about an operation twist, about a yield curve control. So is this operating behind the scenes? They can't because it's against the law. Um, There's a very well set codification of law. I I personally think the Fed's committing perjury every time it goes in front of Congress. But that's another story, is that the Fed can't say this to Congress, because first, the Congress would just go berserk on them. Um, they can't. They probably can't even say this to Treasury, although I, I think there's a wink, wink, nudge, nudge, or if not even the direct communication between the two now with Yellen. And, But the Fed does have a, a legitimate reason to enter the Treasury market for X amount uh, every month, every every week, every day. I don't know. I don't know when they actually come in, but they come in a lot. I mean, forty billion per month is a lot of a lot of transaction. So it's the transaction that counts, not whether they're buying or selling. And second, the the Fed doesn't doesn't operate to a quarter system. In other words, a demand supply uh, of interest paid out. Uh, they went to interest on reserve balances, so that was offset. They operate on what they what they they think is a neutral. Uh, uh, there's not, it's not an equilibrium. It's, it's uh, certainly for Fed funds, it's just a set rate. Uh, and they, they went to interest on reserve balances so that they could, they wouldn't have any problem with that. They wouldn't have any pushback from the banks, like, you know, shut up and accept sir, because why? Because we're going to pay you an interest rate, um, uh, in which was sort of an okay idea until they actually got to five and three eighths Fed funds. Um, now, uh, with like say U.S. Treasury 10 year, if the Fed decides to administer, and I'm running a treasury desk at, uh, at any dealer, I'm not going to argue with the Fed. I'm not going to say that five, four and a quarter is a stupid rate or, you know, four, three eighths is a dumb rate or any rate is dumb. Um, so I'm just going to do whatever you want. 
I think last year there was a very interesting situation where um, a few large high frequency traders came in and jammed the market. They just they sort of realized this this hole was existing, so they shorted the hell out of U.S. Treasuries and drove it well above five uh, percent. Um, and the Fed was howling mad. Uh, and in fact, because it got in the way of what they wanted to do with U.S. Treasury curve. Uh, so therefore, uh, Gensler kicks in and there's a whole list of rules and regulations saying, yeah, sure. So you know, go and buy U.S. Treasuries all you want. But you're now a recognized government dealer and you're now can only do a third of any auction as per law. And not only that, you buy more than 10 million, you have to report to us daily what exactly you're doing. And if you keep this up, you're going to inherit like three or four Fed guys to sit on your treasury desk. So all those games stopped, although there is still some between QRAs, mm -hmm. uh, there's still some games going on. But it's, it's uh, the fact that treasuries now it stopped at like four and a quarter versus like three, seven, eighths of February, um, I think is a sign that that gaming has gone. So we're, we're back to the Fed. Uh, the Fed controls the treasury market. And so how does the, and Mel, I'm, I'm, so, I'm so sorry, but this, you know, if we're just pulling out this, this thread here. How does, if the Federal Reserve controls the entire treasury market, how does that not impact the economy? The mortgage market, sure, that's its own thing, but every other interest rate is based off of the risk-free rate of the treasury market, either SOFR, which is basically what the one month treasury, or the you know, overnight rate is set by the Federal Reserve, or the 10-year auto loans, credit card loans, business loans, private credit loans, it's all set by what the Federal Reserve, if the Federal Reserve controls the entire treasury curve, they pretty much control everything that's not the mortgage market. So how does that not put a crimp on the economy, George? Well, let's take revolving loans, which I, I think you'd agree that the duration is based upon the credit quality of the, the guy who's like maxed out his credit card. Consumer loans. And, yeah, it, but they're, they're, there's very few fixed consumer loans now. It's mostly revolving, right? Um, that went from like, 5%, it didn't matter what type of credit you were, to like as high as 27% now, and it hasn't come down. So that that sort of like pushes back to what you just said. Uh, and auto loans, uh, I went and bought a car. I was sort of a little insulted what rate they gave me. Um, but that that is definitely tracking what I just went into, not U.S. Treasuries. Uh, and it goes through the whole list of... Um, of, uh, of, of credit quality uh, and credit product. They are not tracking U.S. Treasuries and they stopped tracking it in January of 2022. There's, they, you, can't, you can't argue against it. Um, and that being the case, and knowing that there is a risk-free rate, you have, to, uh, you have to go on a quest to find out where the hell the, the risk-free rate is, um, seeing as the, it's not reflected anymore in the U.S. Treasury market. Right. I, I, it trades off of the spread of treasuries and the spread changes. So uh, I, definitely in the case of auto loans, this, uh, as the risk-free rates has gone up, the auto spread has gone up. So if interest rates run from zero to 5.3%, instead of going from five to 10.3%, they've gone from five to 12.5%. So the spread has widened. Like, like I was in private credit, the spread has narrowed. So th th there's spread, but may maybe your argument is high interest rates, high credit spreads indicate a strong economy. But I don't know if that's the case. I mean, if, if no one, if auto loans are twenty percent, I don't think that's no, no. I'm not saying that. I'm I'm saying that um, uh, the credit quality of auto loans and maybe it's getting a little more flaky, but it, they're they can be re, they're rehypothecated, right? A tow truck can show up at your house and take your car away, uh, and as um, and especially when when used cars were were going to the moon, um, if anything, they're they're better quality than they've ever been. Now, used car um, market is is uh, whack is waning, so uh, it's still a a fairly consistent credit quality. Um, so that being the case, uh, that spread to treasuries is not reflective of just high interest rates. It's reflective of the same phenomena that I'm pointing out: mortgage-backed securities. And you see that in all asset-backed securities. You'll see it in all bank balance sheets. The 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 tiering of credit to risk-free hasn't really changed much, but only if you do not accept U.S. Treasuries as being the risk-free rate. Mel, what are your thoughts on all this? 
Well, I mean, I think, as you said, you know, George knows more and has probably forgotten more about the treasure. Oh, come on, come on, Bill, dig in, dig in. I, I love it. Discussion. Well, well, here's the, here's the thing is, is I'm not seeing, I guess, the this whole treasury uh, situation as the most, and maybe you're not either, as the most kind of key germane element to what we're seeing going on in the financial market. So what, what I'm doing is I'm looking at the financial markets and I'm trying to understand you know, why are they doing what they're doing and what are they likely to do going forward? And and so what what I do come back to, I guess, is that all of these things like supposed rise in unemployment rate or maybe a inverted curve or any of these things that people have been using over the last couple of years saying, hey, these are signs that, you know, the economy is not as strong as people think it's going to fall off a cliff or what have you. Those are all kind of either BS or simply not important. And what is important? Well, one element is the fiscal spend. But then I'm also saying the other element that we're seeing is just, you know, the, the, there are broader kind of structural financialization elements at play in our society, whether that be the move to essentially push all American workers into devoting a substantial amount of their paycheck every period to an S&P 500 index fund, whether it's looking at, you know, maybe some some slight, you know, interest rate differentials that are driving capital to the to the U.S. Uh, financial markets, and that all all of these things are essentially creating a perfect storm where we're we're getting people are getting this notion in their head that if they if they simply hold risk assets, they're going to have these incredible outsized returns, and it's becoming a bit of a self fulfilling prophecy and you're getting to a point where standard valuation metrics, price to earnings, uh, discounted cash flows, uh, discounted dividend models, all of these things where like you could listen to a CNBC commentator a year ago, like, OK, uh, you know, S&P is at 20 times earnings. It's a little rich. You know, I need to pull back and, and, and I want to retrench into something like bonds or something. And in why that that narrative is wrong and why I think we could see S&P 500 at a 30 times multiple in the next 24 months, because people are simply, it's almost like a, a game of musical chairs or a greater fool theory where people are just starting to say, look, this, this is what's happening. We're seeing it happen. We're seeing the old rules of what a good valuation for the S&P is uh, go out the table. And so therefore, you know, you're stupid if you're not throwing all of your money into the risk, into these risky assets. And what I, you know, had talked about in our last program is that I think that that game eventually does come to an end. And it is similar to what we saw, for example, in the 1920s. You had amazing companies in the 20s. You had RCA, you had General Motors. These were companies that over the coming 10 to 20 years were going to grow exponentially. Um, but what happened was their, their, their prices just got so far ahead of where they needed to be that then you had the crash. And so what I think is happening is we're getting all of these old valuation metrics being thrown out the window. We're piling into these risk assets. These valuations are going to get to a certain point where what's going to happen is the, the crescendo is not going to so much be a very specific like event or collapse or something substantial changing. What's going to happen is the the psychology will begin to shift. I think that shift is going to be precipitated by a realization of the unfunded, you know, entitlement liabilities, that issue coming to a head in the 27, 28, you know, 29 time frame. And that that once that psychological shift happens and you start having a few big investors, like in the 20s, you had Joe Kennedy, or now who knows it'll be, you know, the chief at Citadel or it'll be whoever coming in and saying, okay, my mind shift has changed. It has changed. I think this free ride assets are doing nothing but going to go up. And if they correct, there'll be minor and short lived corrections. I now see that narrative as no longer the, the dominant narrative and people are going to begin to, to pull assets from the market because everybody's going to have huge gains and, and that this pulling of assets away from the market will just like, this is a self-fulfilling prophecy in turn become a self-fulfilling prophecy that's going to have a whole bunch of headaches for itself. And so I think, you know, the, the treasury discussion is, is a fascinating one. And I, and I think George agrees, like it, that's, it's also kind of in one sense, neither here nor there, as far as what's happening in the, in the broader financial markets. 
so you you're still bullish on on st- the stock market. Uh, earnings are now beginning to go up, but the stock market has gone up way more than the earnings have. So valuations have gone up, and I'm just looking at price to earnings ratio is now at uh, a 27, which is historically high. And I'm not adjusting for inflation and growth. I'm not going to you know ex- explain why, but I, I like uh, just using the simple price to earnings ratio. But it's possible that's pricing in a lot of growth, and the growth could come. I mean, we've seen what Nvidia's net income has done. It's it's uh, tripled, it's quadrupled uh, in in a single year, and that you know maybe other companies are not going to triple their their companies. But you know, if if Apple's revenues and it goes up forty percent or, or even twenty five percent, maybe the you know the rally that happened over the past two months is justified. And and stock market moves price in future expectations, perhaps more so than the bond market. So is your view, Mel, that Earnings will rise, but the stocks will go up more than the earnings. So valuations will just get more and more expensive. Yes, precisely. So I, I do believe earnings will grow. Uh, but I think a lot of people, they're saying, look, we've now passed the multiple expansion stage. If we're going to have an increase in the stock market in the coming years, it's going to be because the the E is going up, um, you know, not the multiple and and I think if you look at what we could have in earnings growth, we could have you know very nice earnings growth. We could have high nominal GDP. Um, I, I think there are you know uh, fiscal impulses and other inflationary aspects of policy that are coming one way or the other in the coming years. Reindustrialization policies, um, tariff policies, uh, various other uh, programs and platforms. Um, if it's a, a, a Harris regime, you know, with a Green New Deal type uh, spending. And so the, these things are, are happening and these are going to create earnings growth. But I think we're even going to see further multiple expansion. And so it might not happen all at once. It's not going to happen in a straight line. I'm not talking about what the S&P is going to do over the next, you know, three to six weeks. I'm talking about, you know, I like to look out at least like like a 12 month period when I'm talking about where I think things are heading. Um, you can always have, you know, one off crises. You can have certain uh, things happen to kind of dislocate or take the markets off of this track. But eventually they're going to return to these large structural themes that are that are occurring. And this, you know, uh, essentially, I believe, is right on course. And I think when you're seeing things like certain asset classes underperform, uh, the thing to look at is to look at for those to catch up. So I've talked about reindustrialization. If we wanted to get a little bit more granular, talk about a stock sector ETF like XLI, the industrial, uh, you know, that's been in a bit of a consolidation phase. We've seen uh, gold in a bit of a consolidation phase. And so I think we're just like continuing to rotate through uh, the, the different, asset classes and in in that the market pundits will always find a narrative to fit. Well, OK, interest rates are coming. So now it's time to buy small caps or, uh, you know, we're going to have reindustrialization. And so that's why you want to own copper. And that, you know, what, what's what's happening is it's just that musical chairs, people are starting to put the money into different areas and they're going to seize upon a narrative to just continue to run up different areas. So we might you know, take a pause for the next quarter or two and say the Qs and maybe the Qs do well, but not as good as the Russell. But then that will in turn be a consolidation, a a pause that refreshes, and then we'll see another leg up and they'll come up with a narrative, whether it's AI, we're finally starting to see, um, you know, earnings uh, resultant from the AI push that's been put in place, whatever, whatever it is, these are the stories that I just anticipate coming and they're going to fit it. And then what you're going to do is eventually it's just rising tide, lifting all boats. And we're getting the uh, essentially the the quintessential formation of a bubble. And why do you think this has to be a bubble? Why can't the market rise in line with earnings expectations? Why, why do valuations have to get so extreme? Is it just human nature and ultimately collapse? Is it just human nature? I think it's human nature combined with the incentives that you see in place in you know financial markets so if you're like a portfolio manager and you've been bearish and and now you're getting fired or you haven't owned nvidia and so or you you know i talked about the 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 payroll uh deductions so i i think we, we have a 
it, we don't have a market like we had, say, 100 years ago, where you had this kind of small cohort of investors that were working at uh, banks and investment houses that were partnerships with their own capital and their own money saying, what do I really want to pay for a, uh, a, a revenue stream of future earnings? What's, 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 a, what's a good price for that? We're, we, ha we have a whole bunch of massive forces um, taking place that are essentially creating these you know, uh, artificial buyers in the market. Mm -hmm. So that's the structural part. And then I do agree with you on the human nature psychology part, right? Like, I mean, look at look at how bubble you're talking about a land bubble, the Australian land bubble, Florida land bubbles. Um, you could talk about, uh, you know, the 1929 stock market bubble. You could talk about the tulip bubble in, in Holland. All of these bubbles, they tend to have a certain pattern to them. You know, they, they, they tend to, like I said, have a very big psychological component. And, and that's why I also see the psychological component um, kind of having the seeds of the ultimate bubbles decline is that all of a sudden people are going to say, oh, my God, this is ridiculous. Why am I paying 36 times for the S&P 500 earnings? This is crazy. And then once that money starts coming out, it starts feeding upon itself. And so this is really kind of human nature uh, 101. Yeah. And one hallmark of a bubble is limited supply, at least for a time. And one thing I, I said, you know, I've been saying over the past year is that there is not a huge amount of IPOs or SPACs or company going, going public. So this demand for stocks can only go into the stocks that already exist. And there are fewer stocks now than there were in, in, in 2000. In, in 2021, I think what pricked that bubble, and I do think it was a bubble, was this huge amount of SPACs and supply and these really low quality companies went public at $10 billion, $10 billion and soaked up all that money. We're not seeing that yet. And maybe you know what, what, it, it, stocks won't decline until, until we really see that IPO window happen. George, do you agree with Mel that this will be a bubble and that you're super bullish on stocks for now, maybe the next year, few years, but that ultimately this will end in tears. This, this bubble will collapse. What are your thoughts? I, I cringe a little bit. I, I'm not super bullish on, on equity. I just think equities gap are discounting to the, the nature of the economy, which is based pretty well solely on an understanding of the Federal Reserve ability to tighten or they will tighten in the future, trust us. Um, that is no longer, so therefore, the equity market is just going to resume where it should be in terms of valuation, you know, normal valuation to the economy. The one thing equity has always done is it's either like grossly undervalued or grossly overvalued. It's never, it never just hangs out as per my understanding of NGDP uh, or any, any variable we want to look at. So therefore, this correction um, or a realization that the Fed has decided not to do be a monetary agency anymore uh, will end with what looks like a bubble. Uh, it will be. It, it will be. But I, I see that as a, a a speculative phase in the standard Minskyan type of terminology. I use Minsky because it's it's pretty clear, and, and I'm not bright enough to think otherwise. Um, once that starts, um, I disagree with you that. The, the, the supply of equity never determines equity value. It might have a, a short-term setting, but what determines equity value is the amount of, uh, I'm not going to say liquidity, but what, is, what determines it is uh, the amount of debt, the amount of financing that's available to go from a hedge position to a speculative position to then a, a you know, I can, I can borrow whatever amount I want to go buy as much equity as I want or any risky asset and therefore keep up with the guys at the cocktail party who are all bragging about how much money they made over the last two weeks. In Minsky words, that's a Ponzi stage. Uh, and we get, and then at some point there's a, 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 um, a change from debt just to finance equity with sort of an asset liability balance, although it's pretty, pretty uh, spooky, uh, but that is a mania. And then it carries on so that debt starts to be required just to finance debt. Uh, equity has a duration of like, uh, you know, I don't know, seven to 15 years. Uh, the debt financing is usually just overnight or just very short term. Uh, so as people have to roll and then also the institutions who made this loan have to borrow, uh, that ends up with a debt pyramid 
uh, we, which almost has a certain to it, certainty to it that it will collapse. Um, and uh, uh, that's a crash. Um, now, I think everything we're talking about now, I don't even people will remember what we said 15 years from now. Um, the, the U.S. is very strong. It's getting stronger. It's huge. It has seniorage. It's risk-free. There's absolutely no question that the U.S. is going to survive all this stuff, uh, if not even realize what the hell we're talking about. Uh, and uh, there'll be a Marjorie Green in the Congress 15 years from now, only it'll be a different person. But every bit is goofy. Every bit is uh, as uh, as whatever you might want to describe your values to. Um, and life will carry on and the U S will be more powerful, uh, more influence. There'll be less of a global there. There's already, I don't see any global effect on the U S I see there's a hell of a lot of U S effect on France, but I don't see any effect of France on, on the U S I, I don't think Basel matters at all. It's just trying to, the feds trying to organize itself to something or other to stay relevant. Um, and then the last thing I, 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 I point out is that, I am a huge fan of the Federal Reserve System. I think it's the greatest creation that democracy has come up with in the last 200 years. Uh, and it is so required to, in, in, in difference with to, to Mel, it's so required to, to, um, to tone down, if not prevent, what we had 100 years ago, 150 years ago, the Gilded Age. Uh, the mass uh, Elon Musk's with uh, a bunch of guys uh, doing hamburger flipping at McDonald's. Uh, that difference is getting bigger and bigger. It's it's a replica of why the Fed was created in the first place, which is to tone down that boom bust that that Minsky and phases of um, uh, liquidity availability that's too flush, and then suddenly there's no liquidity, and I mean liquidity in the short end cash, um, and that. That ends, that ends with the Fed governance uh, in terms of like toning things down and trying to um, redress inequality. Uh, now, the COVID remedy did a lot to, to give a start to that, but we must have a Fed. And I think where we're gonna get the Fed again is when we do get into this, and in this I do agree with Mel, uh, if we do get into this, um, uh, this Ponzi stage, which will be just as clear as anything. It'll just be as clear as how much Fed fiscal spend has been. Um, but everyone will be into it because, gosh, if you don't talk about it and get into it, then you're, no one's going to talk to you. Uh, you know, you're, you're, and therefore the crash is going to like just make Congress live it. Uh, plus, it'll be a new Congress because all the Congress guys will be fired and uh, they will readdress the situation of a no Fed world. And we will get a Fed probably more powerful and more effective in monetary policy than we, we had like 10 years ago, 15 years ago. So that's my call. Right. And George, when you say the stock market will boom because the economy will boom, I assume the connection there is because when the economy booms, corporate profits will boom because in countries where G GDP growth is incredibly high, but earnings do not grow, such as China, the stock market performs really badly. So I just want to make that connection clear for the audience, right? No, no, I, I'm, I'm, I'm saying, I'm saying uh, I, if I understood you right, I'm saying something else. I'm saying the economy has already boomed yes. and the economy likely will continue to boom. And that's not causing the stock market to go up higher. It is the discount between reality and uh, where the stock market is now, which is still, although it's less so now than say two years ago, which is still pricing that there's a very effective uh, bearish impact from the federal reserve. Now, as soon as people, as soon as everyone agrees with me and they realize that, holy cow, there is no Fed and the only the only offset to inflation is equity and risky assets that aren't going to fall apart on you, then that discounting between the reality of the economy uh, as set by the fiscal stage uh, will close uh, to current equity valuations. So I think it's about 20, 25 percent. But then the real show starts where that will appear to most people as a mania or a start of a bubble. And people like, as you said, in Japan, everyone's dancing and the stupid people are watching the people dance, you know, to explain why you should get into the Nikai uh, when it was only halfway up or, or two thirds the right, way up. Right, but George, but George, so so in, like, in countries where GDP growth is high, but corporate profits do not grow with GDP, the stock market does not 
tend to boom. China is a prime example. So just there is when the economy booms corporate in America, corporate profits boom. So it is a fundamental valuation thing for you, right? Well, first of all, S&P earnings have not boomed. Uh, they're, they're doing OK. They haven't boomed. Now, corporate profits, as measured by the BEA, have boomed. Uh, yeah. So if we if we get rid of the idea of the S&P earnings have anything to do with anything and for various other reasons. Well, they have a lot to do with the S&P, right? Not really. OK, so you um, think. Sure so you OK, so you think that if the economy booms and the, the economy grows more than the S&P 500 profits, the S&P 500 will still still boom. Uh, OK, that makes sense. Jack, let me correct you. S&P profits have already boomed. They're tracking. I mean, something's making up these BEA corporate profits that they report every, every uh, you know, it's lagged a, a, three, a quarter, but it's coming up every quarter. Yeah, it could be helpful. I don't know. It's uh, definitely all of Wilshire 5000 by definition, but it's, it's, it's definitely whatever the ratio of S&P 500 to Wilshire 500. It's a big chunk of the S&P 500, and it's not reflected in S&P earnings. So S&P earnings are not really all that useful to come up with a valuation of S&P. What I'm saying is that this boom has already occurred. But then it has, it has in 2020 and 2021. In 2022, large cap costs went up a lot. So the, a lot of the mega cap tech stocks, Facebook, Meta, for example, revenues went up, but costs went up a lot more. 2023 was the year of efficiency. So corporate profits have, so you're right, but the, the stock market has gone up more than corporate profits. I mean, the valuations have gone up as well. Yeah, that's not in the data. What you just said is that's in the popular opinion based upon S&P earnings, reported earnings. But that's certainly not in the national account data. I'm, I'm referring to S and P 500 earnings, which pr presumably the S and P 500 prices off of. I, I'm going to I'm going to uh, wave them away just the way I wave away U.S. Treasury 10-year S and P earnings are clearly not reflective of how much money S and P 500 companies are making. It is impossible to have the corporate profits as reported by the BEA, which does a pretty good job um, in terms of its corporate profit. Uh, it's table six in the NIPA, NIPA tables number six. Uh, it's very clear that there, it's been on a roar, uh, that there's, uh, as far as profits go, there's every bit of just a normal valuation increase just to catch up with where the profits have already gone. What I'm saying is the S&P assumes that those profits will drop because they've still got this myth of um, the Federal Reserve is, you know, when they say they're going to tighten, they tighten and they mean it and inflation and so on. And this discounting that's, that's from the Fed is going to come off the market. Got it. Thank you. Okay. So, so, so uh, Mel, the, uh, a lot of the corporate profits that George is referring to, um, which I, I know about, I have seen, but I have not analyzed it in any detail that, that George has, they... Uh, uh, connect quite closely with the earnings of, let's say, the Russell 2000, which is the smaller cap company. So they still are public. And over the past year and a half, there's been a huge boom in the S&P 500 and in particularly large cap stocks, stocks associated with uh, artificial intelligence, infrastructure stocks. It's not just tech stocks. Don't believe the people that tell you it's just the tech stocks. But the, the laggard has clearly been the small cap Russell uh, uh, 2000. And for a long time, people said the Russell 2000 is going to catch up. It's going to catch up. And it hasn't. But it, it, it over the past two weeks, we're finally seeing some strength there. What is your view about small cap stocks? Yeah, so small caps, you know, they, they have some idiosyncratic things with them. They, they tend to have more exposure, right, to some of the uh, banking issues that we saw in 2023, um, you know, different real estate or commercial real estate exposures and things like that. But at the end of the day, um, you know, looking at those valuations, um, uh, part of the long-term thesis I have is that as these asset prices go up, these uh, multiples are going to go up. And so if you look at, you know, what happened, you mentioned Meta earlier, right? So Meta, when Meta was trading at like $89 a share, that was trading at like, you know, seven times earnings. So on Meta's path from $89 a share to $500 a share or wherever it's trading, um, yes, there's been earnings growth, there's been real earnings growth, but that earnings growth is in no way reflective of the move from 89 to, to 500. It's primarily been multiple expansion from seven times uh, PE um, to, you know, whatever it is now, I'm sure it's at least probably 20 or, or more. So we've had massive uh, multiple expansion. We have had earnings and corporate profits expansion um, and growth. 
but the multiple is what's been you know primarily driving it. I think most of the gains, um, with maybe an exception of a stock like Nvidia, which is a bit of an outlier where its earnings growth has been so spectacular that its multiple has actually stayed the same or gone down. But like you said, don't just focus on the tech stocks when they're looking at it, the rest of it. And I think what what people are seeing when they're looking at other parts of the market, they're taking you know, say the, the, the 490 stocks, or you take the RSP, the equal weight, and you're seeing a relatively, you know, normal uh, price to earnings multiple, not nothing completely out of the ordinary and under 20 multiple on the equal weight. I think that's still got a lot of room to run. So I think, you know, we will see uh, uh, equal weight do well, we will see Russell. And I know people have been talking about this for, for a long time. And I'm not saying that it's going to be this massive transfer of money from the big caps into these stocks. As everybody knows, the Russell 2000 total market cap is less than the market cap of Microsoft. So there's no way to to do like a one for one transfer. We're going to continue to have, you know, tech stocks do well, but they're just not going to be maybe the favorite for a few months. And there'll be a little bit of a consolidation period where people say, okay, Apple is relatively fairly valued. It doesn't need to go up 20% in the next two quarters. But then, you know, that consolidation will happen. And the, I think the, the phase continues to, to pile in. And what's driving this is all the other things we've talked about. Well, you know, it's, it's fiscal spend, it's sovereign debt bubbles, it's creation of, of money through the commercial banking system. It's the piling into financial assets. It's a financialization of our society. And that these, these are these longer term structural trends that are in place that are continuing, you know, to drive this. So when I'm looking at different pockets of the market, if I see an area that's significantly underperformed and been in a consolidation phase for a number of months, that's an area that I want to take a closer look at and say, okay, what could be a, uh, a narrative or a catalyst for people to say, okay, I need to, to move into that. And so I think we're seeing that with some things um, like the Russell. I think it, it's starting a little bit with gold. We technically hit a new high in gold uh, last week, but it didn't really break out. I'm looking for a solid convincing breakout of above 2,500 um, in gold. I don't know what could precipitate that. It could be a very dovish Powell at Jackson Hole. It could be some of his commentary next week at, after the Fed meeting. But I, I think, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if in two to three months um, or by the end of the year, let's say, you know, we had gold closer to 3000 than than 2500. The Russell uh, 2000, I'm looking at the valuation and it says it's a price to earnings ratio of, of 28.75. So actually slightly above the S&P 500. I know that a lot of Russell uh, 2000 companies are are not profitable, and I attribute those to two main factors. I would guess one is the inordinate number of companies that went public in 2020 and 2021 that were low com- you know quality companies. And where else do they go? The Russell 2000 index, and also the narrative about uh, higher interest rates are going to hurt large cap tech stocks because of the equity cost of capital. That theoretically makes sense, but these companies have so much cash, their, their actual financial position is not harmed at all. I just saw Google reported they earned a billion dollars in net interest income or uh, interest income, I should say, in, in per quarter. Uh, but the Russell 2000 companies are actually indebted, in some cases heavily indebted, and they do have these shorter duration, uh, uh, you know, more floating rates, uh, loans, they do have to refinance, as well as a structural factor that if a company is great, it's it's probably going to get the S&P 500 because the, st- the stock price is going to go up so far. But all of those, you know, Structural weakness so far, you still you still are bullish on small caps. Yeah, definitely, and I'd agree with you know George said he was going to wave away S and P five hundred earnings in a sense. I could wave wave away the the Russell two thousand earnings as well because I think it's more about the flows of where the capital wants to go, and you've got this small bucket um, of Russell two thousand, and you you don't need to have huge amounts of money go into it to make uh, the PE multiple expand even further than that already high multiple you mentioned. And that, that, that kind of, you know, this, they can come up with the story after the fact to match it. So they can say, Oh, well, the rate cuts are going to, you know, be good. We've got, um, you know, whether who, whoever gets elected, it's going to be a more, you know, onshoring, you know, U S centric focus, and that that's going to be powering some of these companies going forward. Um, and then the last thing I would say at the Russell, so I do think that's 
that piling in is what what's going to drive those returns. But you're you're right. The Russell as an index is at a disadvantage to the S and P 500. The S and P basically is a slowly actively managed index, right? If a company's not doing well, it gets yanked from the S and P. Um, the opposite happens with the Russell, where you're pu constantly pulling the good companies out. Uh, with the S and P, you're constantly uh, picking the bad companies out. And so, just from a structural point of view of the nature of the index. Um, the Russell, in a sense, is disadvantaged vis-a-vis -vis the S&P 500. And so one would expect to see, you know, the S&P do better over time. Obviously, if you took the 500 stocks that were in the S&P 500, say, 30 years ago, uh, the return on those 500 stocks is, is probably poor, very poor. Uh, who knows how many of them aren't even around. And so, you know, the, the S&P, in a sense, it is an actively managed index. It's just not uh, doesn't have a huge amount of turnover, but it is, in a sense, um, an active index. Right. And it's, it's rules based. Mel, in our first conversation, you explained why you were so bullish, but that there would be a collapse around 2027. A reminder of viewers, as well as George, why you think that this bubble will inflate until 2027, but ultimately it, it will end uh, with an implosion. We talked about, okay, so there were some massive changes that happened around 2020 with, say, Social Security uh, trust funds. So we have had a large amount of, of workers uh, relative to those on Social Security uh, payrolls, and that all the way up until 2020, there was actually enough money coming in from the current employees um, to cover the Social Security expenditures. So about four years ago, that changed. We're now eating into the Social Security trust fund, you know, every month. And what what's happening is that all of that Social Security trust fund, around two trillion dollars or so, that's in there, that's really a, a loan to the government, right? So the, the that money, it's not it's not sitting in like a checking account. It's it's the United States Treasury has been able to use that money and sell to the Social Security Trust Fund these special debt instruments that are basically treasuries, but they're only available for the Social Security Trust Fund to buy. So th those, those are now being drawn down. What that means is that the Treasury had essentially a free funding source, which was excess Social Security payments until 2020. Now they're drawing that down. And then what's going to happen in around the, the end of this decade is that the Social Security Trust Fund is actually going to go dry. The nature of the Social Security law is such that you can't, um, without a change in the law, just have the Treasury start paying out Social Security benefits. And so this is going to necessitate some sort of congressional action in order to keep Social Security benefits whole. And we know how dysfunctional we have a political system. And to essentially right the ship with entitlements, I see that as the the psychological catalyst for people getting nervous and recognizing that this bubble that's been building basically since the 2022 20, lows that's going to be building until say 27, 28, as we get closer to the next presidential election, that the, the concern around entitlement funding and how that is going to need to be addressed and the congressional need for action in order to do so that this is this is what's going to be that uh, that proverbial straw that breaks the camel's back that starts doing a sh major shift in investor sentiment, where they start to want to pull away, and that that's going to start that um, self fulfilling kind of doom loop the way we have a little bit of a virtuous cycle now where people just you know are piling into the markets um, and people are going to start to want to pull out of it. So it's not as if I see some massive structural thing that is going to happen and then that's going to be a good legitimate reason for the market to kind of collapse i rather see the human nature uh side of it where the bubble is brewing the bubble is growing and that this entitlement crisis is going to be the narrative that people grab onto to explain why you know a 35 times s p multiple no longer makes sense and that's what's going to have people rushing for the exits and that's what's going to lead to the collapse just to explain that for the audience so currently and uh, since it was enacted you know by i believe fdr the social security is funded by the social security trust fund which is funded by payroll taxes so you know every pay, uh, paycheck you get at, at the uh, end, end of the two weeks part of that goes you know into that fund it is not funded from 
the treasury. So do you know if we are building bombs to sell around the world, we don't worry about where the money is coming from because it's either going to come from taxes or it's going to come from the treasury uh, borrowing money, but it's going to come from the, the treasury. Whereas social security, it, it, there's a special pot. So what would be needed to fix this crisis would be to say, actually, just take it, take the social security money from the same treasury pot that everything else comes from. Don't have it be this segmented thing. And that could be an act of, uh, uh, you know, an act of Congress, but you're right. It does require an act of Congress. Do you see that act of Congress being passed? Because I have to say, you know, when I, uh, when I was a lot younger, I remember the Republicans beating on about this drum of we have to do entitlement reform and uh, cut Social Security, basically, to so make sure seniors get paid less uh, as a percentage of, of GP. But now I think the Republicans have realized they're, they've looked at who, who's voting for them, and uh, a lot of those people get Social Security checks. And I think, I mean, just looking at Trump's platform and most Republicans, that's not t- talked about at all. So I would you see there being a, a bipartisan um, and I can see the Democrats definitely doing it. Could you see a bipartisan, you know, them just fixing this issue, or you know, it is the the, the loss of confidence, the fact that they have to sw- uh, Congress has to pass this act, or is the loss of confidence that there really is a a you know a a, a bankruptcy of the Social Security trust fund? Yeah, well, I think it's a it's a larger issue in the sense that look, people will come could come on here and say, Mel, you're none of this really matters. Social Security isn't that big of an issue. We can raise the retirement age. We can increase the employer and employee deductions by a percent or a percent and a half. We can maybe means test and take away some of the large. I think the top Social Security payout is actually close to $5,000 a month. And if you think about who's getting that $5,000 a month, a lot of the people who earned enough during their lifetime to get the 5000 a month Social Security check are very wealthy. And so I think I think there are ways to dabble around the edges and kind of fix this in a certain sense. But then, you know, you, you have to look at it in the context context of also look at Medicare, which is slight is set up slightly different. And a lot of the Medicare expenses are being paid for by the Treasury. And if you look at that monthly Treasury statement I mentioned, it lists out all the um, expenses by department, uh, cabinet level department. The biggest uh, expenses of all the departments are not Homeland Security. It's not the Department of Defense. It's not even the Department of the Treasury with the interest expense. The the, the department is with the biggest expense is um, the Department of Health and Human Services, and so th- that's where you're. You also have not only Medicare or uh, Medicare and Social Security, but you have Medicaid. You have all of these uh, social safety net programs, and so I think. What what I'm seeing is the Social Security issue being like the spark that really is a larger problem that's not just Social Security. It's also Medicare. It's also these other social safety net programs. And if you just had Congress say, well, you know what, we're just going to print enough money for this to happen, you're going to get into such a uh, amount of debt issuance that you then start to ruffle, uh, I think, the feathers in the Treasury market, which we've talked about that being somewhat manipulate it, but is there a limit to how much they can manipulate or control it? Because if the issuance, not only do we start running like basically two, $3 trillion deficits as things are, but now we're going to start funding social security through debt issuance and all of this, like, how, like what really does start to happen to the bond and the treasury market? And then you start to get into all those other things I've talked about where they're prepping ways to tuck treasuries away onto bank balance sheets and um, making changes to the capital ratios and stuff like that. So, I mean, I think that these are the the issues that are going to be floating around in the air at the same moment that we have a ridiculous uh, valuation in in the in the financial and the capital markets, um, and that those two are basically going to combine for like a, a perfect storm, which is going to be the the narrative ar- around the collapse. Now, I'm generally with George that in 15 or 20 years, you know, will we be able to work our way through this just like we worked our way through um, other collapses, whether it's a you know panic of 1907 or the great financial crisis or even the depression? I think yes, we will be able to get through it. But that's just saying, you know, there th- th- there could be some uh, serious pain along the way. Very interesting, George. What do you make about of all this? Like Mel and I, Mel and I agree. It seems 100% how we got here, uh, but I can't say we agree with much after that. I think a big problem right now is 
a lack of imagination, a lack of appreciation on seniority of the United States. Uh, MMT guys get this right away. They really understand it. Uh, Michael Pennis understands that when he starts talking about um, uh, the identities. The U.S. is going to be here, or, or the question is like, uh, Social Security and various other costs of the U.S. government are what? Um, a three-month issue, duration of half a year uh, at some point. Now, it's it's going to go on and on. So, But as far as like managing it, it's, it's a very, it's a money market type of a problem. Uh, the duration of the United States is, I would say, infinity right now, uh, as far as math goes. In other words, you'd be very bold to say that the U.S. will have a problem, say, 10 years from now, 20 years from now. 100 years from now, I guess China could nuke us all. I don't know. But I can't come up with any reasonable discussion on how the duration of the United States won't solve all problems. And all our problems are basically, right now, my read is just a political ruckus in terms of who gets the spoils. You know, are the Republicans allowed to spend it or are the Democrats allowed to spend it? Uh, who gets the lobbyist money, et cetera, et cetera. It has nothing to do with like concerns with the U.S.'s um, liquidity, or um, or how long it's going to last, or you know, in other words, we're not going to have any pain to the U.S. We're never ever going to have a depression again, unless we have an existentialist world war. So, you know, it, it just gets silly to even talk about it. Almost, um, we are not as we were into the Great Depression. We are not as we were even going into the GFC. Uh, we are. The closest thing to come, and even then they're sort of not as sophisticated as us, is Rome. And then you get really hairy, you know, talking about like examples. There is no reason to have any concern about the U.S. coming under stress in terms of credit or availability of funds or will or anything um, that could cause a problem in the financial markets. Um, part of this, too, is that I don't think many people realize that inflation is a tax. It's not a debasement of the currency. It's not like the U.S. is going into some end game. Um, also, inflation, uh, yeah, I don't know, under 10 percent or so is uh, it's happy days for everybody, uh, except for maybe 10 percent of the rentiers, the people who really have a, a 30 year horizon of their vested George, are you saying that inflation of 110% year over year, meaning that the price level goes from $1 to $2.10, that's happy days for everyone, you're saying? It's happy days for entrepreneurs. It's happy days for the large tech company. It's happy day for the guy at Chick-fil-A who gets from 20 bucks an hour in California to that 30 bucks an hour. It's happy days for I don't know what percentage, but certainly majority of Americans. They're told, though, that they're going to suffer and suffer greatly. Uh, but that's that's because of uh, the popular view that uh, which I think comes from the rentier class, uh, which Keynes, of course, a lot of people mention. It doesn't mean I'm a socialist, but it's not, it's from people who who really depend on a fixed return for the next 10, 20, 30 years to maintain their position uh, in the U.S. Uh, for politicians. You know, inflation's happy days. They get to fight more, and, and there's more spoils to come about. So Google doesn't mind inflation. Um, Navita, they love inflation. Um, so that the way to look at it, not to, like, defend inflation or not, but the way to look at inflation is, well, what the hell is it? It's for the U.S. with seniorage, inflation is a tax. And it's like if the tax receivables for a reasonable point of time, like, say, five years, ten years, doesn't look like it's going to square the repayment of par. Um, you know, if I buy a five-year treasury and I'm a little queasy about whether uh, I will get my par back in five years, then what I do is I have the implicit tax of inflation to make sure I do get par back. Um, and so the, this whole idea of, um, uh, you know, the U.S. has some sort of uh, uh, reasons for concern in terms of its longevity, for its like status, for anything that makes sense to the majority of Americans is I don't I, I don't think it's valid. George, George uh, th thank you for that. So I will just say I think that people who you know, come from not that I am from here there, but people who come from countries with incredibly high inflation rates like Venezuela and Argentina, uh, they're 
I don't know if I would say that the majority of them are quite happy. And I might say, uh, I don't know if I think that the U.S. economy is as strong as you. How can you how can you illustrate the United States with Venezuela? That's like that's like trying to like say what's going on with ten cities in San Francisco is defining the U.S. It's, it's but, but George, I, if the U.S. The, the, the reasons that the U.S. has a, a economic excellence, which I largely agree with you on, are precisely the reasons why in the U.S. inflation would not reach one hundred and ten percent. So the day that inflation in the U.S. reaches one hundred and ten percent, it becomes Argentina. That's what I'm saying. You disagree, well, and that's fine. But I, I just I just want to move on. Um, I completely adamantly disagree. First of all, inflation did hit twelve percent. Uh, just recently, um, yeah, now it was only for yeah. like quarter, right? It was only for a flash, but it did hit it. Um, and if you see the inflation as a debasement of the currency, i.e., the value of the U.S., you're absolutely right. And then you are Argentina, Venezuela, Weimar Republic. You know, there, there's a whole, whole list of examples. But I think it's a huge mistake to see any input or information from global or non-U.S. countries. The U.S. is on to itself. It's it's a it's a phenomena that uh, we've never seen. We we you know you have to go back a thousand years before you or two thousand years before you even figure out like what the hell's going on. Um, it is remarkable, um, so that we're alleviated from any of these concerns about you know now the one thing that the U.S. could get into, uh, which it did. Um, uh, and I will use history as uh, you know intense internal political strife, them versus us. Yeah, George, I I just this is a whole two hour conversation in, in itself. Uh, I I just want to say I actually what I do agree with you on is that the U.S. could all, could could do a, a political solution, and that uh, as the U.S. increases its debt load, that is stimulated to the economy. In other words, what what is the issue? You know, Mel, if you think that as you and George agree, that the large fiscal deficits run now, if the fiscal deficit increased as Social Security had to go under the Treasury and the Treasury had to finance it by issuing debt, why wouldn't that be more stimulative? In, in other words, why can't, you know, I mean, you know, Mel, when you were probably a kid in the 1980s, there were probably TV ads of people t talking, telling you about how, the, you know, telling your parents about how they had to buy gold coins because there's too much debt. I mean, this thing, that's the ultimate thing. And I, I kind of went with George on this. It's impossible to predict like at what point the US mammoth debt will be a problem. You know, I mean Charlie Munger, you know, rest in peace, the great great minister said that, you know, you have to if if you believe that the huge US debt isn't going to be a problem eventually, you probably if you believe that, you probably also believe in the tooth fairy. Uh however, but it's impossible to know, you know, at 100% debt to GDP, GDP, people were concerned. At 70% debt GDP, people were concerned. When it was at 60% GDP, you know, and then in the 1970s people people have been concerned about this so much Debt to GDP now is 120% uh, federal debt. Why not 134%? Why not 140%? Like, how do you know when it, it's going to be the ticking time bomb? Well, I mean, I think there's different ways you could look at it. You could look at it and you could say, okay, you know, some people have said, you know, countries start to get into issues when their interest expense is greater than their defense, or then they might define hyperinflation when you're having to print money simply to cover interest expense, which we're not anywhere near if we're at a trillion dollars in interest expense and our the government's revenues are like, I don't know, four or five, six trillion in tax revenues, whatever it is. So we're not anywhere near those things. But my point would be, we don't need to turn in to Venezuela or Argentina for there to be significant shock waves in our financial markets. So, you know, people have observed that just when the 10 year was starting to, to creep above or hit 5%, we started having certain issues because of the banking system. And so I think what when you look at, you know, the amount of outstanding debt we have and what we're doing, it, we, we, we have to roll it over all the time. And the fact that we're doing a, a lot of bills and different things, it's even going to be a quicker turnover in debt. So so when you start having to refinance at these higher rates, that's when you start getting into problems that we didn't have in the 1980s when uh, government debt to GDP was 30 percent instead of 120 percent or whatever it was, 35 maybe. And so I think the the cracks will start to show up in certain ways that the international financial system is organized once you that it's not really built to handle, you know, six and a half, seven and a half, eight and a half percent. Um, 10 years. And so can I ask a, just a question, Bill? Sure. Jack, why does the international system matter? It would matter to me if I was Germany, but 
why does it matter to a Chicago Uber driver? Oh, I'll say this, uh, George, is that a large part of U.S. treasuries are owned by U.S. banks, U.S. households, and the Federal Reserve, which are all obviously in the U.S., but a large, I don't have the exact number off the top of my head, China owns a lot of treasuries, Japan owns a lot of treasuries, so the rest of the world does finance the U.S. deficit, um, as Michael Pettis has talked about. I, I disagree with that. He was talking about balances, not financing, and um, the China has no choice. They have to have those U.S. treasuries to maintain the six, seven yen. Or not the yen, sorry, yeah, RMB. Yeah, yuan, yuan, yeah, yeah. So in many ways, the holding of U.S. debt is actually a debt of the holders to the U.S. Like if they want to play in the U.S., they better pony up and buy that debt. It's a shakedown. Um, now, as long as there's enough people in the United States who have a vested interest to maintain that, uh, they have no choice. China has no choice. Uh, you know, the, the Scottish widows and orphans in terms of representing the legacy of British Empire, uh, same thing, the Dutch guys, um, Japan, they have no choice. Uh, they have to own U.S. debt. Otherwise, what Pettis was talking about, the balance of payments uh, fall apart and they, they're, they're screwed. Uh, we will survive. We'll just, you know, issue more debt. Um, but they're, they're screwed. So they have no choice. And that's what that's what an identity is called. It has to be done. Um, so the international system is is uh, the argument I would make is that, you know, instead of having three more aircraft carrier task force, I allow this holding of the U.S. debt offshore and I give concern to the international markets. Or if I'm Brainerd, I want to maintain my position of power at the Fed by talking about China instability. But as far as like Americans, like you, all of us probably on this call, uh, whether Germany falls off the face of the earth, as long as it doesn't cause a world war, we don't give a, we don't give a damn. It, it right. really has no to, to answer your question, though, George, like why do I like we're talking about financial markets, a financial market, you know, uh, catastrophe. So you look at in 2011, you know, why would Greece, the, the sovereign debt yields at Greece matter at all? Well, because, you know, who owns the Greek debt or what? So I think if you had, you know, why would anything that happens in Europe matter? Does it matter to the Chicago Uber driver? If the United States were a perfect island, a perfect autarky, if we weren't living in essentially a financialized society where there are connections between Deutsche Bank and JP Morgan and all like if you started to have your example, let's say Germany really did fall off the face of the map. I mean, I think most people would say that wouldn't be good for the U.S. financial markets. And so I think that you will have an impact um, from these financial yeah. repercussions. I, I think there'd be a big commotion to Amazon, the big commotion to Wall Street. There'd be, uh, you know, 3% of the U.S. populace in terms of its political power would have a big commotion in trouble. But I don't think 97% of the people give a damn. Um, and that's that's why Trump's America first type of, of thesis has, a, has resounds with a lot of people. Um, why do we care about Italy or Greece? Let them rot. Why do we put all this money into NATO? Let them rot. Now, I don't think that's a good idea um, because there's evil people out there. But as far as financial systems go, um, that's probably more true than, than not. Um, now, I'm not, I'm not saying that we don't want to like pay attention to what's going on in Japan or, or China. But I, I think that when the, when, the, when the rubber hits the road, it's just a national security issue. It's not, it's not an issue of finance. It's a big issue for J.P. Morgan if they lose all their European earnings. Uh, it's a big issue for Morgan Stanley if all the real estate holdings that they still have goes tits up in, in China. But it is not an issue for the the um, but for the guys who just work for J.P. Morgan. It's not an issue for um, the Americans. If anything, it probably induces a boon as we back away from this global trade, you know, free market type of of idea and we we start to revert back to being self-reliant at a higher level than we are now uh, we'll never we'll never be able to put the genie back in the bottle we'll, we'll always be in an international sphere but it i don't i think it's way overdone to to be concerned about what's going on in spain or italy but for a humanitarian interest that we don't want to uh, add to or or be the cause for suffering but as far as like u.s finance i, I think it's way overblown
Right. Earlier, George, you referenced seniorage, which is the difference uh, between how much government money is notionally and how much it costs to produce. So for like a gold coin, there's there's seniorage, but not that much because gold is expensive. But for paint, uh, fiat currency and, and printing paper money, you know, it costs a lot less for the mint and the tre- treasury and the, and the Fed to create a hundred dollar bill than it than a hundred dollars. And I, I think the real question is. Does the rest of the world continue to own U.S. Treasury debt? I, I think for a very long time, people have talking, been talking about diversifying away from the dollar, whether into Chinese yuan or, or euros. And I think you've seen ever so slightly a move away from the dollar, but you know, not even it's not even as if the euro has gone up. It's like the you know the Norwegian krona went from zero point one percent to zero point three percent. It's 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 moving very slowly. That could change with Russia and the BRICS and Saudi Arabia, but that's. That's for another discussion. The final topic, we've you know gone close to two and a half hours, is the upcoming uh, uh, 2020 election without getting political, you know, only talking about politics in terms of how it- 2024, let's go ahead, yeah. 2024 election, thank you, yeah, it's been, it's been, uh, it's been a while. Um, is, do you think the fiscal gravy train will continue running if Harris, Vice President Harris gets elected president, if uh, former President Trump gets, gets reelected? Uh, how does that depend on the different houses of Congress? You know, are you in the camp that yeah, this this train is going to continue to to go fast until it goes off the rails, regardless of who's in office? Or do you think, hmm, no, if if you know, I can see permutations where actually the deficit uh, goes down. Uh, Mel, you first, and then George. Yeah, I think generally, I think no matter who it is, we might have a difference between you know who are the winners, who are the losers. If it's Harris, does that you know favor maybe certain uh, green orientated companies r- relative? to what, you know, what happened under a Trump administration. Um, I think some of the things that that we've seen people talk about um, with J.D. Vance and some of his views, I think he's actually said uh, he agrees with, say, Lena Khan in um, her antitrust actions. He's, he, he, you know, maybe he's a little less favorable to something like an Amazon. But at the end of the day, Vance isn't running for president and Trump will make the decisions that Trump wants to make. Um, So I think at the end of the day, you're going to see the lobbyists still have impacts and, you know, the 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 gravy train continues, the fiscal spending continues. Um, Maybe we get more spending and less tax cuts with Harris. With with Trump, we get uh, more tax cuts, but uh, less spending. Harris gives us more spending, less tax cuts. So basically, it's more or less six of one, uh, half a dozen of the other, in my opinion. And I think that the the train continues until it hits that stopping point that we I talked about earlier, which isn't a hard stopping point, but more a, a psychological shift uh, around the entitlements. Thank you, Mel. George? I think it should be realized that as soon as Trump's elected, uh, he's a lame duck. Um, you know, he has got no legacy. He's got no real, he's, he's not going to get reelected. Uh, he's got no pull. He's got no power. Uh, he's gone out of his way to base himself, uh, or not to have his power sourced from his base, uh, which is a pretty fickle, um, reason to be power. Maybe he can threaten Congress that in the next election in two years, I, I will like that. I'll have my guys rise up or not. Uh, but basically as far as, uh, power, uh, he's like any president, uh, but even more so. Uh, as a lame duck. So a lot of, you know, Trump focus will very quickly dissipate. So I think it's Vance, assuming that they get in. Uh, and Vance is uh, an interesting story. It's, uh, we're talking about Peter Thiel. We're talking about, uh, you know, what's that guy's name? Arvin, whatever they, you know, the monarchists and the Silicon Valley guys. Oh, that guy. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it gets, um, it gets interesting. And and Vance is going to be shooting for another eight years because he won't want to be around till 2036. Uh, so he's talking about a regime and he will. So he'll have, he'll have immediately an inordinate power as vice president versus previous administrations, uh, certainly more than Kamala Harris had. Uh, and now uh, Kamala Harris coming in, uh, she will be laden with um with the with the constant, you know, which has been the story for the Democratic Party for you know a century plus, with the state and local guys, um, you know the the idea of a federal power of the of the Democratic Party to make change, well, a good example was that what you know Kumo says why you guys 
dither about what the hell to do with COVID, I am now putting New York on pause. And not only that, I'm going to rack up like 500 billion really quick for hospital expenses and everything. And if you don't let New York go bankrupt, you got to give me all the money in about six, seven months. So the, the state and local is still very powerful, if not the power for the Democratic Party, um, California, what's going on in San Francisco, so on. That being the case, if Harris gets in, it's going to get even crazier in terms of spend. Uh, it's going to be, uh, the, she's going to be very concerned about any inroads. She's going to try to negate uh, uh, the enthusiasm for uh, the populism of uh, Trump. Now, Trump it will be there for a bit. Um, and even Vance, uh, Trump is very much a populist. So he's going to spend. He's just going to try to divert it to, uh, to red states. So I think it's going to be chaotic. I, I, I see no reason why, you know, Congress is going to be very slow to reclaim its mandatory and discretionary rule base and setting its budget. And there'll be, uh, it'll be very foggy in terms of what the, what the budget is going to do for the next five years, like it used to be. Um, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be pretty chaotic. And then at the same time, we got the situation with the Fed that I've got on perhaps on nauseam in terms of how explosive the market can end up being, which I think Mill and I agree with uh, in terms of what will happen, but for different reasons. So it's going to be a really, uh, I guess, interesting time. It's going to be great stuff for you, Jack. You've got all sorts of shows to do next year. Um, but that's my call. Thank you, George. It's been a pleasure having you you both on. Um, let's you know, tell quickly about uh, uh, the work that you do, George. Tell, tell our audience, remind them about the Monetary Frontier, your sub stack. And Mel, tell us about uh, Quaz, your financial thriller. The Monetary Frontier was, uh, um, I guess I'm retired, although I'm loath to say it. And my risk manager, I, my partner uh, in life, uh, she was starting to really look askance at all the time I was spending in digital media, I that I'm nuts. So I had to come up with a good reason as to why I'm actually making some money. And this is actually a livelihood. It's not, it's not just some uh, old character babbling away. Uh, so the monetary frontier was created, and it, I hope it does have value because it's um, it's the distillation of uh, thirty odd years of of uh, knowledge, often hard won and and learned the hard way, not by any sort of great uh, intelligence. So um, I hope that if you visit the monetary frontier, you find it valuable. Quaz, it's a financial thriller. It's a fictional book, but it has a lot of the narratives. Um, of my thesis. It, it, it has uh, corrupt central bankers. It has a uh, financial markets uh, controlled by quantum AI supercomputer. It has a attempt to put in a global central bank digital currency, all while the world kind of sits on the precipice of a financial collapse. It's uh, been really successful. Thanks to everybody who's, who's bought it. If you haven't, check it out. Uh, the audio book is available now. Uh, that just came out earlier uh, this month. And uh, if you like any of these themes and you're also a thriller or a fiction reader, uh, a la Tom Clancy or something like that, um, I think you would enjoy Quaz. Thank, thank you. And um, I, I, George, I, I don't think I got your view on uh, a small cap. Are you also a bull on the Russell 2000, let's say? Well, well first, small, the Russell 2000 is market weighted just like the S&P 500. So the, the fact that, that it's like some liver, a diseased liver collecting bad toxins is wrong, um, especially, I don't do it anymore, but especially the every annual reweighting yeah. that we would trade, just like the, the S&P 500 reweighting. Um, it's a very vibrant, very exciting. And I think the, the amount of dead issues in the Russell 2000 are always there. It, it was, you know, it's been, it's just, it's just the way the Russell 2000 is. Um, so I think it's more of an issue of, of valuation. And I think there's, um, there's large, they're not nefarious, but there are some big players that I think have to establish a, a very large uh, Paris trade, if you will, uh, which the last one was short Russell uh, and all the various small caps and long S&P 500 and various large caps, you know, with the obvious players, the, the FAB7. Um, which is not really meant to make money, although it, it does. Uh, that's what they want to do. But it's the basis for the stock loan books. And then going out from that, controlling the option markets, 
mm -hmm. uh, to do uh, zero trade date to expiry and all sorts of games that have been going on for the last two years, um, three years. Uh, and so I think the Russell 2000 to the S&P 500 does have a, a obvious relative value, which will be realized, but with this very large game going on, uh, and now it seems like there, the, the, there's an effort to try to figure out, well, what do we do? Do we carry on? I think we took our short off on the Russell 2000. We got dumped our longs and the large caps. So do we carry on, reestablish it? Because the real money to be made is in the, uh, the derivatives, uh, the options, the dispersion books, and some of the other plays. Um, there's other people which you've had on who would have a much better answer than I on that. I, I think the Russell 2000 will always be the Russell 2000. The S&P 500 will always be the S&P 500. And what I noted about the S&P 500 valuation, probably even more so for the Russell 2000, but you have to respect that it's a small cap. It's a small index relative to the S&P, and there's some very big players that control it for, I don't know, six months a year. And I think they are. Got it. Well, uh, yeah, the index construction is, is a really good point. Uh, this has been a very long, very informative conversation. Uh, thank you both so, so much for coming on. And thank you, everyone, for watching. People can find you, Mel, at, at Mel Madison one And people could find uh, uh, George at uh, Bricker in, uh, excuse me, Bicker in Brattle. Um, talk, talk soon. Okay. Thanks so much, Jack. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Remember to check out vanek.com slash motefg to learn more about the Vanek Morningstar Wide Moat ETF, ticker MOAT. Lastly, Forward Guidance is available not just on YouTube, but on all podcast apps. And a video version is available on Spotify and Twitter, where I post interviews regularly. Thanks again. Until next time.